before the debut in Moscow, Russia, Bellator MMA has arrived in the Valley of the Sun. You are looking at the Footprint Center in downtown Phoenix, Arizona on a night that will end with the last two standing in the light heavyweight Grand Prix. A world titles fight tonight between Vadim Nemkov and Julius Angliskas. The other semifinal between Phoenix's own Ryan Bader and Corey Anderson. A lot of excitement about an alternate stepping in to fight for a world title. And even more excitement about Ryan Bader, the former light heavyweight champion, returning home with a chance to reach the finals. But that, as we say, in the Home Shopping Network is not all. There's more, including what now shapes up to be a number one contender fight in a lightweight division between two former lightweight world champions. That title is going to be decided in Dublin in two weeks between Peter Quigley at Patricky Pitbull. Benson Anderson and Brett Primus want their place in line. And, of course, Henry Corrales opening up the main card. Always a fighter fight against Slava Parubchenko. But we begin with a rarity, an amateur fight, not a rarity to talk to Big John McCarthy, but if the woman on the left looks vaguely familiar, we've become very familiar with her husband. We have become familiar. That is Maria Henderson, the wife and boss of Benson <laughs> Henderson. You got that right. <laughs> and uh, she is uh, in her, this will be her second amateur fight. The big thing in this, look at the weight. It was supposed to be a straw weight. Santiago came in way overweight, 10 pounds. Henderson wanted the fight so bad. She said, I don't care. I'll drink water. I'll get bigger. Now you have a fight. Let's see what happens. If you want to put on a bunch of weight in a short amount of time, I'd go right to you for the advice. <laughs> <laughs> to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator 268 as we get the prelims underway now here at Footprint Center, downtown Phoenix, Arizona. We'll kick off the prelims now with amateurs set for three three-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner first at five foot three, weighing in 126 pounds even. Her amateur record, oh and two, she fights out of Casa Grande, Arizona. Colette the Saucy Santiago. And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot one, weighing in 123.7 pounds. As an amateur, she's one and oh, she fights out of Phoenix, Arizona, Maria Mars Henderson. In charge of the action, the referee Mike Beltran. You can only imagine what goes on in a house between husband and wife when one is in a fight camp? When they are both in a fight camp? It is not a place you want to be. Oh, ladies. Well, at least, I don't, at least they don't have four kids to say. Oh, wait a oh, minute. Yes. They do have four kids. This baby. Uh, so, sort of a, a peek behind the curtain here a little bit when we're dealing with an amateur fight right away. Good, strong jab. Maria Henderson down. This is exactly where Maria Henderson wants to be. She's got very good jiu-jitsu. She's a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Very good top game. And right away, take a look at the control. She just needs to settle down here. Don't worry about getting the finish right away. Work for the finish. Nice job of flattening her out. She's got her flattened out. She's got her far from the fence. Punching while you're getting choked is yeah, it's it. It's over. You saw the desperation shots. You see shots like that, you know the end is coming. Great job by Maria Henderson in staying composed. That is so hard to do when you're a young fighter. You want to get these things done. She took her time, sunk in the choke. She knew she had it. Great win. All right, honey. I did my part. You're up next. That has to be. What a great job. The emotions for Benson right now, who has a monster fight in about three hours from now, to have that stress off his shoulders. Oh, and you know what you're looking at there? He was way more nervous for her fight yes. than he ever will be for his. Take a look at what happens here. Beautiful job of getting the body lock. She gets herself inside, goes back to that body lock, trips the leg into a beautiful side control position. 
Then she gets that back, gets the hook, sinks in that choke. All those punches are for naught. They're not going to do anything. You see the tap. Fantastic finish by the mouse, Maria Henderson. Her second amateur fight and her second win, but does it tonight with her husband holding her tight, and she does it on the big stage. Big sign of relief as the first half of the Henderson night is over. Michael C. Williams makes it official. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end of tap. By way of a rear naked choke, 40 seconds into round number one by submission. She's still undefeated, Maria Mouse Henderson. A feel-good story with all kinds of external pressures going on. You see the happy couple much happier now after the 40-second submission win for Maria Anderson. John Crouch on the end. David Bashad. Maria gave him a lot of credit for really helping her with her stand-up and getting her to where she felt confident. Jen Brown, Josh Thompson, we talked to the Hendersons this week, and you could just feel they were they're just more nervous for That's each other. This has to be a right huge there. sigh of relief to get this out of the way so quickly and so easily. Absolutely, especially since Benson's got to go back and get ready for his fight tonight. Hey, but that's a great way to kick off the night here. Our first ever time in the Footprint Center. Bellator making a statement tonight. What'd you think? Well, I thought she did a good job of making sure that he's not as stressed out for yes. a longer duration. So he can just go in the back, settle down, and get ready for his fight. Great job, by the way. Great job. All right, well, let's talk about his fight because he is going to, that's Benson Henderson, of course, is going to be fighting the former champ in Brent Primus. Uh, we saw them yesterday at the weigh-ins. And, and you look at him and you kind of can see a bit of a size difference between the two of them. But when it comes to Benson Henderson, Josh, he's no stranger to fighting bigger opponents, is he? No, he's fought at uh, 170. He's gone up to 170. He's fought um, some of the top guys at 170 as well. Now, he's been successful, and he has not been successful, but he knows how to handle the size and the power of a lot of those top, uh, a lot of those heavy fighters. He's very elusive. He's very strong himself in certain positions. I think the well-roundedness and the experience, I think, will definitely be a factor for him. Oh, this is a home, uh, home fight for him, right? We talked about uh, the crowd being here, and he said there's no extra pressure, but you fought at home a lot. What's that like? Because there can be some pressure that comes along with having the extra responsibilities on fight night or even fight week leading up to it. Well, he hasn't fought here since, what, 11 years ago, I believe is what it was. So 11 years ago, he fought here. But you've learned how to probably deal with the stress, also having to deal with fr uh, friends, family, all of those things that come with fighting in your hometown. Tickets, where am I going to sit? Are we doing an after party? Are we having dinner before? Weigh-ins, all of those things. I'm sure, though, he's a professional. He's done this before. He knows how to handle it. He's one of the top guys in the world. He's been around a long time. And I would say he's one of the living legends. Like, he's one of the guys that... He's still fighting and active, but he's already kind of in that legend category. Absolutely. Uh, like you said, he's not even retired. We still talk to talk about him as a legend. Let's talk about Primus really quickly. Uh, you know, he's coming off a loss. He wants to get uh, his belt back. What do you want to see from him tonight? I, it's very simple. I want to see. I know he's good off of his back. I want to see him off of his back, though, and on top. If he gets a takedown and gets on top, I think he's going to have a great performance tonight. His losses have come when he decides to be on the bottom. That's it. He's got to get on top and dominate from the top position. Well, both fighters told us that they want to be more more aggressive tonight and if they put their money where their mouth is Sean I think we're in for a good one tonight back down to you no, I don't think there's any doubt that's got really fascinating potential to go a bunch of different directions a lot of talk in the co-main event in the Ryan Bader fight about practice about what happens in practice Ryan Bader has been training with Sullivan Cauley for a while and very excited about this young man and first time we saw him we could see why John uh, he is absolutely a fantastic fighter he's dynamic he's got power and he is just aggressive. Look at these elbow shots, quick, going after hammer fist, just not allowing his opponent to breathe. Just putting it on him and finishing the fight. You gotta love that in a young, young fighter. He is a guy that a lot of people believe has the potential to be a world champion. 205 at Bellator has, is stacked at the top, and then the young prospects coming up four, five, six fights in. It's amazing. Yeah, it's great. Look at this, 1-0 against 1-0. As they say, someone's O is gonna go. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Footprint Center, we feature the light heavyweight division throughout the course of the main card and in the prelims. In fact, now we'll go to three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division.
Introduce the blue corner. At six foot one, weighing in 204.2 pounds, his professional record one and oh, fighting out of Tucson, Arizona, Dion. Big smash! And across the cage, his adversary, fighting out of the red corner. At six foot three, weighing in 205.2 pounds, he too stands at one and oh, fighting out of Mesa, Arizona. Charge your referee Ryan Brookman. You ready? You ready? It's fight! For the crowd, Sullivan Collie already has a fan base. I saw people walking around downtown with Sullivan Collie t shirts on. He is a Golden Gloves champion twice in Arizona, is Sullivan Collins. You can do that as well. There's the big difference when you're looking at these two guys. Deion Clash, a jiu-jitsu stylist. Sullivan's got a very good grounding off of his back, and he might end up there. Does he have the wrestling ability to take Collie down and be in the top position? When you see an early shot like that, it might be a little more aggressive. Is that how you got hit pretty hard with that kick? Maybe harder than he wanted to. Still a little bit harder. Again, nice job by Collie, but he's hiding those kicks behind his hands. That's well done. Nor Dion Clash wants to fight. How do you get it there? Well, he's working for it right now, but if you look at the hand placement, he just switched it up, which was very, very nice. Yes. A lot of people are just call that a takedown. That's a change of position because he wasn't able to do anything after all of that hard work. Couldn't keep him down. Collie was able to immediately get up. So now we're in a position where it's a change of position, but it doesn't really score with the judges. But I like the clash is going after him, trying to put him on his back. I think the first 15 seconds destroyed any illusions he might have where, you know what, I'm going to be fine. I'm like, no, I'm not. Maybe he's so a what you little, do? little long and a little, little power. And he's so polished in his boxing and his stand up. You're training with Ryan Bader and you're training with CB Dalloway. You're training with Terrell Ford. Now, when you're training with guys that are at the top, it starts to build your confidence. You're in the training room with him, you're doing well at times, you're going, oh, that was a nice left leg. Check, look. When you're able to do well with them, it's giving you confidence to tell you, oh, I can be with these guys. The, the polishing of stand up and to oversimplify. Sullivan Colley coming straight ahead versus the looping shot. It just takes so much time. But you can tell that Dion Clash is very athletic. He's a good athlete. He's strong physically, but he's trying right now to use a lot of that strength to get him where he wants to be. And it's not working for him. That will end up just breaking down his gas tank. He's been very efficient with his kicks. He's hitting tight in behind the jab. And there's more. You saw right there, you saw how class was off balance after the kick, and that's just based upon he's putting a lot of energy out right now in this round. longer in any way to take that. One of the nice things you did see, though, is look at how Collie was able to control that range. He didn't crush the space. He kept himself within a distance that he was able to land those shots. And he spent 28 seconds in the cage as a pro. Very polished, he's taking his time. Yeah, I'm very impressed with what Dion Clash is doing. He is giving him a lot of problems based on being a guy that I will not go away. Pull him out, pull him out. 
this position, you, you can use that fence almost like it's a bit of a springboard and bounce him off of it. Randy Couture is one of the best at bouncing guys off of that. Oh, beautiful. It's a big and shot. It was. Class is taking some big, heavy shots. Only 35 seconds left. This has really been impressive that Dan Clash has stayed in this thing. He has shown he has got some whiskers on that chin because he's taking some big shots and he's still there. his game of five minutes as you're going to see from a fighter in his second professional fight Dion Clash almost made it to the bell but he was outskilled by that young man Sullivan Collins Take a look at the shot here. That right hand, it landed solid. Watch the left, follow it up. He's wobbled right here. Clash took a lot of big, heavy shots throughout the round. You see when it starts to turn him, and then that, when he never saw it, and when you don't see a shot and it hits and lands, it definitely can hurt you bad. Collie starts to open up, and this is what I was talking about. He was able to control that. He didn't crush the space. He got that big right hand. He just starts opening up at this point, hits him with an elbow. A lot of shots in here. And here's the end sequence. Big right hand. You see, look at his legs. His legs starting to be stiff. He's trying to control that body. Unable to really use muscle. He's got to use his skeletal frame because he's so hurt. That's why you see the wobble. Big kick in there. He is seriously hurt. Big elbow. Nice job in finishing by Sullivan Colley. The oh, future at 205 is as bright in some ways as the present is. Alex Belize, Grant Neal, Christian Edwards, Luke Trainer, and now Sullivan Colley getting his name on that list to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Ryan Brueggemann steps in, waves off the contest due to unanswered strikes. Official time, four minutes, 59 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO Sullivan Foley. Two fights as a pro, both in Bellator, both first round TKOs for Sullivan Colley. Guys, if the future of the light heavyweight division is bright with all these young prospects we're talking about, well, the top is pretty good, too, and we're going to see it center stage tonight. Well, you are right, Sean, because at the end of tonight, the finals for the light heavyweight World Grand Prix will be set. Now, tonight, Ryan Bader will face Corey Anderson in our co-main event. And in our main event, the current champ, Vadim Nemkov, puts his belt on the line when he takes on tournament alternate Julius Unglickskis. All right, Josh, let's talk uh, the champ here first. In the opening round of the Grand Prix, Nemkov faced off against Phil Davis. It was a rematch. What did you see from him in terms of improvements this time around from their first fight? So let me give you a recap in their first fight. He was dominating in the first round and somewhat in the second round. He started to slow down going into the third, and Phil was dominating in that third round. So in the second fight, it was a five-round fight. So in that five-round fight, he was actually able to start tearing, picking it up in the fourth and fifth round. Now, there was some good exchanges in that fifth round. It was a little bit closer in the fifth round. But Nemkov dominated Phil Davis from the beginning to the end in that second fight when most people thought that Phil Davis would have ran away with it after round three. Would have went three, four, and five. He was able to get some wrestling and some takedowns, but that was not the case. Nemkov made improvements in terms of relaxing on the feet, controlling the tempo of the fight, and dictating the pace of where it went. He told him he uh, gained a lot of confidence from that last fight. Assume he's bringing that in tonight. Let's talk his opponent, Julius uh, on Glick's kiss. He's coming in, he's riding a night, nine fight win streak. He's undefeated in Bellator. What parts of his fighting style do you think are gonna give Nemkov problems tonight? Well, I think he's gonna give him fits. I think, I think he's gonna end up 
frustrating Nemkov a little bit because he's so defensive. He's very tight with his defense. He's stingy, as a lot of fighters will say. He keeps his hands up tight. He doesn't do anything spectacular, but he's good all the way around. His boxing is straight. A lot of fighters throw loopy punches. He throws everything right down the middle like you just saw. And also, what he does very well is he catches, kicks, and is able to get takedowns off of that. And with, with when he does that, it's off of the straight punches, catching the kick, and when he gets on top, he's extremely big, and he's really strong as well. So when you look at them, matched up side by side, to me, Angliskis is not only just bigger, but he it looks like he's gonna have the strength advantage in this situation. So if he gets to that top position and he can control Nemkov from the top, it may be a little frustrating for Nemkov. All right, well, um, it's gonna be an exciting one. Uh, I cannot wait to it. That's our main event. It's coming up later tonight, Showtime, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific, but let's keep things rolling here. We're gonna send it back down to Sean and Big John, guys. Well, if there is a division deeper in Bellator than light heavyweight, it would be Bantamweight right now to the point where not even sure an eight-man tournament is enough because there are so many, including the young prospects. And every time we see Jalen Bates, John, we see something new. Look, at Jalen Bates is a guy when you're watching him, he does everything well. He wrestles well. His submission game is great. Look at what he's looking for here. Just stays with the choke. Finally gets it, puts his body in the right position. His striking is very good. He's super long for the division. Look at the switch on that. He knows the opponent's gonna go over right to the straight arm lock. Beautiful transition by Jaylon Bates. Sail the tape at 135. This is what I'm talking about. 135 pounds, 73.5 inch reach. That is a long reach. We'll see if he can utilize that to keep Montini to the outside, who is a very good stand-up fighter. To Michael C. Williams. Bravos joining us tonight in the UK Live on BBC iPlayer. We welcome you to downtown Phoenix, Arizona, here in the States, as the Bellator 268 prelims continue now with Bantamweight set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 135 pounds even. His professional record, six wins, four losses. Originally, though Brazil, he fights out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Rafael, the Red Hood, Mobini. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 135 pounds as a professional. He's undefeated, three victories, no defeats, fighting out of Lakewood, California, Jalen Newbreed Bates. In charge, your referee, Jason Herzog. First round, fight, are you ready? Fight, are you ready? Fight! Early in his career, Bates has not been paid by the hour. No, he is not. Now, Martini lost his first fight back after a two-year layoff from the fighters affected by COVID. Seen so many of those with the 18-month layoff, the two-year layoff, the two-and-a-half-year layoff. Talks about this a lot, trying to get your timing back and doing it against a guy with a real high level athlete. Nice left hand by Wong Chidi. Wong Chidi needs to keep this on his feet right now. Nice, heavy hands, heavy hands. Nice job of getting back to his feet by Montini. Nate's still in control of the body right now. When he gets to the fight to the ground, he operates so quickly. Well, look, just look at the nice little job he's doing with how he twined the leg. He's got his foot hooked. That's just keeping it tight with Montini. Montini's trying to work it with the hands, trying to break the hands down. But Jalen Bates does a lot of things, setting his opponent up to go in a certain direction that he is expecting them to go, putting him one step ahead of him, and that causes the downfall of his opponent. Jalen Bates training with A.J. McKee and Baby Slice. 
Talk about a master's class. If, you, if you're living in Antonio McKee's house, that's a master class. That is a master class. Look, a lot of people don't realize how good of a coach and how smart Antonio McKee is just about the fight game as a whole. Doesn't matter if it's MMA, boxing, everything. The guy is a student of combat sports, and if you can learn from him, you learn from someone that understands everything about what needs to be done in that game. You learn how to get up early and run, too. <laughs> And you can hear Antonio, beautiful job of stepping. I was going to say, he needs to get that hook. That's going to help him a lot with what he has. But Antonio, you're in good position. Take your time. All of the right things. Don't, don't start to bark out a ton of information. Just take your time. You know what you're doing. We've done this in the gym countless times. Just work your way through the position. There have to be young fighters where they can easily be overloaded with information, especially in a moment like this. Absolutely. Well, you're taking a look right now. You know, Martini's going for a two-on-one. We call it a baseball grip on the one arm. That right there, J.R. Mason's making the mistake. He's got that arm. Have it. I have a free hand, and I will make you pay for putting both hands on my one arm. Oh, finally trying to use the right arm a little bit. Now he's using it. See, yeah, that's great. That, that sometimes coaching is simpler than with it. Keep doing that. Doing that. There you go. But this is where you look at so Those are not shots that are going to stop Martini, but they will add up and make him move, and that's what you're trying to accomplish. Almost had it. And he's just, you know, keep on moving your arms, always be searching, sliding the hands in different directions. Beautiful job. That's what I'm talking about, that arm triangle position. Okay, you, you're going to beat that. I'm going to go to mount. All beautiful technique and styling by J-Law Bates. He's one step ahead. Oh, it's beautiful. He the arm bar. He still has it. He's got it. That was brilliant. That was checkmate. That's what I'm talking about. Forcing your opponent in the direction that you want them to go. Defend the choke. All right, you defend the choke. Defend the arm in, defend the arm in. Now we're going this way. We still have round twos, right? Exactly. This is what we're getting out of J-Law Bates. Take a look. He got hit with a good shot from Martini. Decides, I'm not going to stay on the outside and do that. I'm going to go to where I'm strong. Works for the takedown. Martini decides to kind of go for the guillotine. Was not a smart decision based upon his positioning. Jalen Bates then goes to the point where we look for that mount position right into the arm bar. Kind of missed the head a little bit on the beginning. You see the head kind of pop free. Sucks it back up. Straightens that arm, hyperextension, beautiful, beautiful show of a submission by Jay Lopez. He was running, he ran out of alley. Eventually, there's nowhere to go. Big block wall at the end. The prospects keep rolling. Michael C. Williams makes this one official. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end, three minutes, 49 seconds into round number one, the champ. By way of an arm bar, he's still undefeated, the winner by submission, Jalen Nupreed Bates. Jalen Bates goes to 4-0. Josh, isn't it the worst when John McCarthy says something is going to happen and then that exact thing happens? It very rarely is that way, though. I want people to understand that, okay? Uh, look, Jalen Bates is amazing. Every time we see him step in this cage, he gets better every single time. The transition we just saw was so smooth. And his opponent did the step over. And most people get confused there, and they lose the position and end up on bottom. He tried to hit the side choke, wasn't able to get there. But what I loved about it is he didn't try to hang out there too long. He made a beautiful transition to the top and the mount, and he waited a second. He softened him up with some good strikes, did the step over as soon as the opponent tried to go up to his knees. When he did that step over, it was nicely done. 
But then his opponent went, stepped over on him as well. And when that transition happened, most fighters will lose that position. He didn't, he stayed with it, stayed tight. Great transition. Jalen Bates is the real deal. He's getting better every single time. This is impressive. I love seeing young talent progress like this. Yeah, he's undefeated, 4-0. Uh, oh. We look forward to seeing more from him. Hey, listen, three fights, three first-round finishes so far. I think that's a uh, great way to start the night here in Phoenix. I like I like Phoenix. Well, uh, here's a look at our stack fight card coming up later tonight on Showtime, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. The night kicks off with a featherweight feature bout when Henry Corrales takes on Vladislav Perlumchenko. Then in the lightweight division, number three, ranked Benson Henderson. He hopes a win over the former champ Brent Primus will put him into title contention talks. Plus, we close out the semifinals of our light heavyweight Grand Prix with our champ, Adin Nemkov, taking on tournament alternate Julius Anglitskus and the former champ, Ryan Darth Vader. He will face Corey Overtime Anderson. And for more on that matchup, let's head across the pond to Bellator's London office and Gareth A. Davies. Ryan Bader and Corey Anderson meet in the semi-final of the light heavyweight World Grand Prix in a matchup that is clearly worthy of being for the title. Darth Bader, the first ever and former two-weight divisional champion in Bellator, who still holds the heavyweight crown, of course, faces a former training partner whom he says has unfounded confidence from their sessions together and has said that Anderson ought to have been stum on what happened behind closed doors. Anderson, meanwhile, seen by many as the dark horse of the tournament, has moved fluently and fluidly through the tournament and has momentum with that smothering style. Anderson says that it was former Bellator standout Ben Askren who transformed his life as a prize fighter. And while a sparring partner for Bader on a second occasion, he realized he was capable of winning a world title. This contest could go so many ways and it will be an arcing challenge of elite physical level chess. They're both renowned wrestlers. Bader recently also added to that with his black belt in jujitsu. This is a pick em fight and we cannot wait. A lot of people have been talking about that fight all week as the sleeper fight of the weekend between Bader and Corey Anderson. And while that training partner thing got a lot of the attention, Ryan Bader was really quick to put it down over the last couple of days. And the matchup itself is really going to come down to the speed of Corey Anderson and whether Ryan Bader is still a legit top 205 guy. That's part of our discussion as we move along tonight. That's, and that's just the other semifinal in the light heavyweight World Grand Prix and the world title fight will finish it off. Well, we've been talking about prospects. It's a night of family affairs. We've already had Ben Henderson's wife, Maria, win her fight. Now, Lance Gibson's son, Julia Budd's stepson, Lance Gibson Jr., and we have seen him before, and he also is another impressive young fighter to add to this unbelievable Bellator list. Man, let me tell you right now, Lance Gibson Jr. is an athlete, but he's not only just an athlete, this is a guy that grew up in MMA. His dad was a pioneer of the sport, and he has wrestled, he has fought, he has done everything that you can do in this sport. Put it all together, his MMA is outstanding, and on top of it, just his technique, you bring that athleticism, he is very hard to beat. Into the second generation athletes, it's a different game. Tail of the tape. Very slippery put. Raymond Pena, very good wrestler, tough guy. 4-0 for Lance Gibson Jr., 9-4 for Pena. If he gets the win, it would be a big feather in his cap. Michael C. Williams. Tonight here, Bellator 268, the prelims continue now with three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at 5 foot 10, weighing in 154.8 pounds. His professional record, nine wins, four losses, fighting out of Tucson, Arizona, Raymond, the true Pena. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at 5'10", weighing in 155 and one half pounds. The undefeated professional enters tonight. Four victories, no defeats. He fights out of Port Moody, British Columbia, Canada. Fearless Lance Gibson Jr. You're ready to recharge Mike Beltran. Hey, where was the, uh, the handling of the business? 
That'll come when he does a little stare down. Now you mentioned the, the wrestling for Raymond P, a top high school wrestler. He is, he's a very good wrestler, and he does become very tenacious with his abilities to try to work at getting his opponent down to the ground. But that's also caused him a lot of problems, because when he faces someone like Lance Gibson, who's got a very good submission game, his four losses have come by way of submission. Very nice takedown. This is what Raymond Pena does best. Get to the top position and work just a hard ground and pound style where he wears guys out, but he's gonna take a whole lot of effort to wear out Lance Gibson. Over guard into the body lock for Lance Gibson. Yeah, I hate that body lock right now. It, it, all it's doing is keeping your opponent exactly where he wants to be. I want to take and I want to make my opponent have to work as far as have the problem of me putting my feet on the hips, start to create situations where you have to defend, now your offense starts to diminish. One of the things about younger fighters who are 2 and 0, 3 and 0, 4 and 0, 5 and 0, they sometimes don't get in positions like this. They're not working out of defensive positions. It's true. But when you're looking at Lance Gibson Jr., look, like I said, he grew up in the sport zone. His dad was a very good submission fighter. He understands submissions well. He needs to just start opening up because you will never get that submission when you're in that close guard position. And Pena fought on the other Bellator card in Phoenix eight years ago. He must have been a part of it. I was there as you a know, referee. You know, well, you, you're, you have this uh, Mary Lou Henner. Ah, oh, look at this. There comes that submission. That's you went for it. I was going to say, that's not in a place the same as you just saw with J.L. Bates as far as the right. hyperextension. And that's why you saw Pena be able to survive it, but you saw that Gibson used it to get himself back to his feet. Look at me in there. He's had all first-round finishes. The main event that night in Phoenix was also a shocking, stunning first-round finish. That was when Brandon Halsey won the middleweight title, beating Alexander Slamenko, subbing him in the first round. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. by Gibson. He can just stay tough with the, the pressure of the wrestling, getting the takedown again now into the open mat. Keep him square. Keep his hips square. You like the body like better here. Or no? No, there is no reason at all for him to take it put. Right now it's not even a figure four since it's on his calf. But this is going to keep your opponent where he wants to be. Who's the one that brought this fight yep, to the ground? You. And if you're the one that's going to lock him into that position, that's where he wants to be. I want you to start to create problems. And the only way for you to create a problem is to open that guard, like you saw him do earlier, that puts him in a position he has to defend. He need to keep his hips high, he's staying safe. Put himself in a good position to win this first round. And every time you're watching Pena right now in this position, every time he gets his head over the top of Lance Gibson Jr., like you're seeing right now, that's a good position for him. It's when Gibson's able to push his hips back and put that head towards his sternum. Now it becomes harder for Pena to land a good shot and easier for Gibson to. She'd still rather see Lance Gibson work an open guard. Absolutely. No, get your out. Close guard is almost a thing of the past when it comes to MMA. You can use it to get yourself set, get yourself into a position where okay, I'm safe, I'm comfortable, let me start to work now. Then open the guard and start creating problems. It's defensive. Totally defensive. Here you go. Couldn't have said that better. Beautiful job, John. I, I can't say that. <laughs> And the time that Lance Gibson sort of gave away trying to figure out the positions. He gave away this first round. But again, a lot of people look. Lance is being very active as far as the punches, but they're not going to get the same credit from the judges as soon as it, and you see Pena land one good hard shot. Good first round for Raymond Pena. 
pro at 18 years old. Deep breath. Deep breath. There you see Julia Bud. Deep breath. Okay, now land a strike. He's let him force the take down, stuff it, and then finish this guy, okay? Okay? Yeah. Another Probably fighter who would give away a round from now and again. <laughs> you would see, there were so many nights, she, she was so frustrating because when she finally fulfilled her potential and had that great run as the world champion here in Bellator, but there were nights you would you would sit there and get just so frustrated because you knew she was so much better than what she was doing. You know, Julia was so physically dominant in most of her opponents, and she would only fight to that certain level where she would sneak a win by when you look, you said, you, you could have gone more, you could have done more. And there were moments where she did, and it was so impressive. But she, what she did become the featherweight champion here in Bellator, and only lost it, you know, a couple of years ago now to Chris Cyborg. She didn't just beat Marlos Kuhn, and she retired Five the moment. legend, and she took the torch. She didn't wait for it to be passed. Well, we finally get a second round, which allows us for the first time to talk about judging. But there's still people that could have seen that first round for Gibson because he was trying to throw punches and trying to do things on the ground. Yeah, well, the one thing that they would look at and say is, well, at least Gibson, when Gibson went for the submission, he went for the arm bar. But you have to be honest, oh, that was a nice shot by Gibson. That, that definitely, that got Pena's attention. Left jab, body kick. But the submission attempt by Gibson was never really there. So it didn't have, you can't give it that much of credit. And overall, the heavier shots, everything was done by Pena. So it should be Pena's round. Stand up a different game here, especially against the South Ball. Just from a body language standpoint, you can see how much more comfortable the last Gibson feels now. And that hurt uh, Pena inside. Did. That one hit him to the sternum. That took some air out of him. He's been hit with some big shots early in this round. Look at that leg. Lays nice knees. He's Beautiful knees job. Again. This is high volume. But Pena's tough. Look at what he's doing. He's getting himself caught where his arm is stuck in a position. He cannot use it to defend. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm talking about. He cannot. That is oh, he's completely blocked. blocked. And there's no way for him to get it back. No way. We're done. <laughs> Raymond Pena used his wrestling brilliantly in the first round, but never got the chance in round two as Lance Gibson completely turned it around. Boy, did Lance Gibson take the words of his father and put, them to, put them to use. His father said, okay, enough of that. I need you to go out there and I need you to start using your hands and get rid of it. I think he did that. Nothing a coach likes better than a win combined with a teachable moment. And that's what that fight was. Fight number five for Lance Gibson. Watch the knee here. That knee connects and you can see it didn't connect exactly on the chin. There was a part of the thigh to the chin. But the knee connected the body. There was a lot of torque on that. And then when Lance Gibson has this position, take a look at the hip position and look where that arm is at. That is backwards. He is completely open on that side. No way to defend any of these heavy, heavy elbows or punches. Lance Gibson just opens up. Big both, shots. Both arms pinned to the ground, helpless. There we go. A little bit of patience. Yeah. A little bit of patience goes a long way. That's exactly right. In life and in the cage. I thought it was a great one. Good shot. That was great. Michael C. Williams will make this one official. Oh, yeah. No, no. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage referee, Mike Beltran, steps in, waves off the contest due to strikes. Official time, one minute, 44 seconds into round number two. The winner by TKO Fearless, Lance Gibson Jr. So Lance Gibson goes to 5-0. That impressive second round, he listened to his dad as everybody should. 
He listened to his dad at the end of round one. He was able to have success as a result of it. He goes to 5-0. and We're not only seeing the young prospects here at Bellator, they are rolling nonstop. But the only downside so far on this night is that every after every fight, John McCarthy showed me his sheet where he had all his first round, he had that right, second round, he had that right. Josh, I can't even call the fights. He's just putting this thing in my face as soon as it happens. Look, yeah, we, we, to, we, we, already have, credit. we already have to grease his ears to get him through doorways. Let's not make his head any bigger than it is, please. Let's <laughs> dial it down, okay? It's got a long night of fights. Let's enjoy this. Sean, please, let's not help. Fair enough. <laughs> You guys just, I love it. I, you know what, I just like to be the uh, the fly on the wall, and, and I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you guys are picking on each other. And we always have fun. <laughs> I love it. We have fun up here. All right, well, if you guys want to have fun with us, you can catch up on Past Fights 24-7 now on our Bellator Pluto TV channel. There's no passwords, no payments. Just drop in and enjoy the show. Uh, available now on all of your favorite devices, so look for us in the sports category. Well, lots more fight action coming your way. But, Josh, first let's talk about um, the first fight of the night coming up on Showtime. We've got Vladislav Perebuchenko. He's taking on Henry Corrales. This is kind of like that throwback style of fight, the boxer versus the wrestler. How do you feel like these two match up? Yeah, it's a contrast style. One guy's a stand-up guy, one guy's a wrestler. And the Sambo style is a two-time world champion, Perebuchenko. And then you've got Corrales, who just loves to, I like to say, throwing dogs. He likes to throw his hands. He's got heavy hands. He's a dirty, not a dirty fighter, but a grimy fighter. So just gets in there and gets after you. And the one thing about Kraus is when I say he's a dog, he's somebody that he will bite down on his mouthpiece in exchange with anybody. We've seen him do it with Patricio. We've seen him do it with the Manos Edges. We've seen him do it with some of the top guys in Bellator. He's winning some, losing some, but he loves to fight, and that's the great thing about him. If you look at their contrasting and styles, who do you give the edge to tonight? You're going to put me in a bad spot here. <laughs> Come on now. Now, look, Henry, I believe if he pulls the trigger and lets his hands go and is not concerned about the takedown, he keeps his range. I think he'll, have, he'll be successful tonight. But Perevchenko is very good at closing the distance, setting up his takedowns off of his punching. If he closes the distance, able to get Henry's back to the fence, he will have a successful night tonight. It really comes down to, like we talked about, styles make matchups. Whoever can implement their game plan will win. All right. We're looking forward to seeing both of these guys throw it all on the line tonight. They're going to be the first fight of the night on Showtime, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Sean, back over to you for our next fight. All right, guys, I'm not even going to ask John how he thinks this one's going to go. He could be writing these things in, by the way, after the fact. I don't know. Oh, I, I don't man. know. I'm just saying I don't know. I didn't say you just don't know. Every fight is already done. <laughs> Randy, <laughs> Randy Field from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, Border City Boxing, Michigan top team. This is another interesting. This is one of those fights. If you're keeping an eye, you're one of those that like to look at the recruits, like to look at the younger fighters coming up. You're saying these are two that could absolutely be somebody someday. And Sumiko Naba, uh, the first time, two, two times we've seen her inside the Bellator cage. It was wow. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, it was more than wow because she is aggressive. She goes after her opponent. There is no holding back when it comes to her style and how she wants to go after her opponent. She's got that Hawaiian let's just scrap mentality and she does not stop until she gets rid of her opponent. So when you're looking at this matchup, Randy Fields, she brings the same type of energy though. She's very aggressive on the feet. She's got a good ground game, very strong ground and pound. Both of these fighters match up really well. This is gonna be an interesting battle. Check out the tail of the tape at 125. As simple as it gets, both of these young ladies, 2-0 and oh in their careers. This is going to be an exciting match. Juliana Velasquez has a long line behind her to Michael C. Williams. Now joining us tonight on the live stream on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports to welcome you officially as we get set now for a flyweight feature scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot three, weighing in 125.9 pounds. In her Bellator debut, she enters undefeated at two and zero, oh, fighting out of Windsor, Ontario, Canada, the Rose City Phoenix. Randy Field. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot four, weighing in 124.9 pounds, with two consecutive TKO finishes inside the Bellator cage. As a professional, she too stands undefeated at two and zero. Oh, she fights out of Maui, Hawaii, presenting Sumiko, Lady Samurai. 
in charge, your referee, Ryan Brueggemann. talking about looking up to a Lima Lake McFarland. Does a couple of things. Makes you feel old, first of all. <laughs> Fighters are already looking up to a Lima Lake for all she has accomplished. But also it just, you know, it, it makes you realize the impact that she has had. Uh, female fighters, obviously not just in Hawaii, but around the world. There's sort of a, a pressure that comes with that. So, you know, talked about that. You gotta have people, no matter what. There's always that person you look at what they've accomplished and how they did it, and you identify with it. And look, Lima Lang came onto the scene like a buzzsaw and was just submitting lady after lady. Just an incredible performance after credit. Then the ones in Hawaii, just remarkable. Crying as she's coming down the ramp but putting on an incredible performance in the cage. This has been a very active first minute here. This is exactly what I expected. Touched, yeah. oh, of, of course it is. <laughs> this is duh. You watch both of these young ladies and they are very aggressive. They both go after being the person that's leading the dance. The real question here is who's going to be the one that's able to maintain that? Let me guess. It's going to be warm tomorrow here in Phoenix. Is that one too? It's possible. Brady Fields has been signed to a multi-fight deal. These are two fighters that have a strong future in front of them in Bellator. Brady Fields is throwing that one-two a lot. She needs to follow it up with that hook. Nice job of catching the kick. Yep, caught it clean, got her down. Not for long. Good job by Anaba to get right back to her feet. Kept Randy Fields off balance as she was on the ground, made her move, getting herself right back up. A lot of positional changes here. Great job by Anaba. Up against the cage, putting a lot of pressure on Fields. Field that landed. More of the boxing background. More the stand up. When do you often start to see fights? These are two fighters in their third professional fight. Where does the curve begin from what they are to what they are going to do? Uh, look, the curve starts from that moment that you turn pro because everything counts at that point. Not that the amateurs are not important, but that's where you're learning your craft. That's where you're learning how to put the pressure and, and, uh, to the side when you're getting into a fight, the weight cuts, all those things. When you turn pro, it's all about that learning curve, but it's about taking, even if you get a win, where was the moment that I did not perform well? What was it that I made a mistake in, and how do I fix that mistake? Nico Anaba was studying to be a nurse and gave it up to fight. Seems counterintuitive. Well, she's stitching people up right yeah. now, so. so. Well, let somebody else do it. Big right yeah. Now. Yeah. Samika would do a lot better right now if she, she needs to go back to utilizing that jab. She's got a good jab. Set up the jab to set up her right hand. Randy Fields is eating big shots here. A lot of pressure right now. Randy Fields has slowed down. Keep your feet moving. 
Rangers. Pretty even three or four minutes, but Sumiko and Nava having a big finish to round one. Yeah, both ladies landing a lot of shots. You gotta look and say that probably the more powerful shots have been landed by Sumiko and Nava. She's done damage with that kick, too. Oh, oh, it's like right on the chin. He'll just try to hang on for 10 seconds. Nice knee to the body. Good elbow over the top. How did this fight change? It was dead even through three and a half minutes or so. You know, it was right about what you're saying, but then you saw Anaba start to land those straight punches. She hit her with the jab, came with the cross, and then that kick came up, and then when she heard her there, big difference in this round based upon those shots. Watch the kick here. Comes up, that tags her clean. And it's just the length of Anaba that is a little bit of the difference right here. That, that's a clean right hand landing. That's what puts her down to the mat. But the length of Anaba is just causing some problems for Randy Fields as far as Fields needs to get inside of that length where Anaba can stay on the outside and land big shots. I really thought the early leg kicks of Anaba made Randy Fields a little more tentative and that, that half second difference all of a sudden, the shots get landed. Well, I'll tell you what, just the last five seconds and the amount of body shots that Fields took from Anaba, that Ready? changes your ability to recover in the round because you're trying to get your win. Bingo, bingo. Fields start to eat a lot more shots. Anaba getting a lot more accurate. That jab is just working beautifully. Majority of those coming in the final 60, 90 seconds of that first round. Now every time Randy Field comes in, she's eating a left jab. Anaba is landing. She's, I don't know what the percentage is, but she's landing at a high percentage. At least every other shot she's throwing is landing. See, you're wrong. Right now, it's 54 percent. You said it's 50, so you're not right about anything. I said at least. <laughs> Second, that goes down to 40. Let's bring it back. She's seeing the damage that's been inflicted here. Uh, elbow gets through. Everything's just a half second slow now for Randy Field. Yeah, and, and exactly what you're saying. You're starting to see she's playing catch up. And when you are playing behind, it's that, you know, it's the chess moves. You start to get one move behind, then you're two moves behind, and you just can't get to back to where you are even with your opponent. Elbows open up a nasty cut. This looks to be in a good spot. Randy Field is trying to fight off. Blood in her eyes, now the submission attempt. An awful lot happening. Speed for Randy Field to deal with. Nice roll through by Sumiko Amarnama. Beautiful body positioning. She felt that the leg was entwined. Continued to circle out out of it to free it up. Nice job going for that arm triangle choke. Trouble. Beautiful setup. Sumiko Amarnama is becoming a force. She's got a She's got an engine. She puts out a lot of shots on her opponent and just systematically starts to break them down. The velocity of that performance stood out to me as Randy Fields slowed down and Nabo almost seemed to go even faster, but not out of control faster like a younger fighter. It's more like, I see the finish line now and I know how to get there. Yeah, you, I mean, she's pushing them to that cliff to the point where there's nowhere else for them to go. And then she's finally getting that point, she pushes them off. She had done a lot of damage before finally going for the takedown. Yeah, this is when she goes for the takedown. And you see Fields is looking. She's trying to look for a choke that's not there. She does entwine the leg, but when Anaba passes it, right here, she's got the wrong leg up. That's why she goes knee on belly, slides over. 
She has the head and arm choke right there in place. A lot of pressure. Beautiful transition to the submission by Anaba. Simiko Anaba made her name winning Cowboy Cerrone's Cowboy Fight Series. So she said, I might be able to do this. Six and one is an amateur, but she looks like a different fighter now. And she is getting better each time out. That is a very impressive veteran-like performance for a pro in her third fight. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, at two minutes, two seconds, round number two, it comes to an end the tap by way of an arm triangle choke. The winner by submission, Samiko, Lady Samurai Inaba. Lady Samurai is 3-0, and oh, and she is with, and her reward, she gets to hang out with Big John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with your winner, Samiko Anaba. You came out here, and you just were on fire going after her, putting a pressure on her, and the jab was a huge difference in this fight. Oh, yes. Thank you to my coach, Coach Wayne Canberra, and everybody else. Man, that jab, stay behind my jab. <laughs> the job is so underutilized. I love it. <laughs> Let's talk about the finish because you took her down and she entwined your leg. You did a beautiful job of coming around to break through that and then you knee sliced over the top and you knew you were going to go for that arm triangle. Talk to me through that submission. Oh, she surprised me with grabbing my legs. Good for her, man. I was like, okay. But yeah, I just flowed with it, felt it, and uh, I've, I've done that position so many times and imagined it in my head, and it came from <laughs> uh, uh, manifestation, man. It's, it's, it really works, yeah. Well, let's, the, I'm gonna go to the point where there's something about Hawaiian fighters when it comes to just scrap and go after your opponent. Where does that come from in you? I know it comes from right here, man. <laughs> um, I don't know. Hawaii people love to scrap. That's everybody, though. That's that Hawaiian spirit, and everybody has it. You just got to let it out, and I let it out in the cage. So thank you so much, Hawaii. I hope I made you guys proud. I love you so much. Thank you, Arizona. You guys are amazing. You guys are so close to home. Hell yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> I will tell you that was a beautiful performance. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Samiko Anaba. Winning fights and winning friends. Subiko Anaba goes to three and oh. Josh and Jen, that was, that was some good stuff from a young fighter who uh, we're gonna be seeing a lot more of. Well, you said it. I mean, for her to be 30 years old and this just to be her third professional fight, the way she carried herself in the cage, in the interview there, I mean, it's hard not to be pulling for her from here on out. The future's bright. I'm just telling you right now, we've seen already in all the prelims, the future's bright for Bellator. The talent is so high. This is amazing. Everything she did was a wonderful performance. Like she said, hit behind the jab. She even said it's the most underutilized weapon in the whole sport, which is true. Then when she didn't hit hide behind the jab, she let the kick go first, then came back with the jab. And then her transitions from the takedown, as well as from the takedown to, to the top position, to the submissions, she showed the full toolbox. And that's so difficult to do with, with someone who's only 3-0 oh now. It's impressive. And how she mixed everything up, and she just did it as if it was so casual. And she'd been doing, she said, like, I've been doing this for years. You know, and she's done that side choke so many times, and it looks so fluid from one side to the next. I've seen fighters have been in the game for years, have not made that fluid of a, tra a transition over the body, to the side choke, to the finish. I, it was very impressive. And even then, the moment at the very end when she was able to talk to John and get her words out and do everything, absolutely amazing. The future's bright for Bellator. I think she made a lot of fans uh, uh, inside the cage, outside of the cage, everybody watching at home. I know I'm a fan tonight. Well, great job out there. All right, well, Bellator 268 continues here at the Footprint Center here in Phoenix, Arizona. We got five down, four more to go here on our undercard before we're going to head over for a stacked main card. Now, we will fill in the final two spots 
of the light heavyweight world grand prix we've got ryan bader he's taking on corey anderson in our co-main event and then in our main event we have the current champ adim nemkov he's putting his belt on the line tonight against tournament alternate julius Anglixkis. and for more on what both of these two men bring to the cage here is gareth a davis what an intriguing main event tonight as Vadim Nemkov defends Bellator's light heavyweight crown in the last semi-final of the 205 World Grand Prix against alternate Julius Angliskas. Nemkov, mentored by Team Fedor, is riding an eight-fight win streak and is undefeated in his six fights in Bellator. The former Russian Special Forces operative says he wants to be a sniper tonight and finish by KO or submission, but is actually ready to also go five rounds. For Angeliskas, opportunity knocked, and the undefeated Bellator fighter has stepped up to the plate. A far cry from earning seven and a half dollars an hour stacking shelves just a few years ago in a supermarket. Angeliskas says he needs to fight to take test himself. He always feels terrible nerves, but you know the saying, if he can get his butterflies in formation, they will become dragons, and then he can breathe fire on Nemkov's icy coolness. The Lithuanian, a striker wrestler, says his plan is to mirror Nemkov and keep it simple. Huge opportunity tonight for Angliskas against a formidable belt holder who has defeated four world champions. Over to you, gentlemen. All right, Gareth, and what makes it so interesting is that Vadim Nemkov has been able to break everybody down. And Gliska's, one of his strengths is his defense. He's a very disciplined fighter. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, he's very tight is what we would call him because his hands are in a good position, his elbows are in, everything he throws is short and very powerful. He's a tough dude. On to the middleweights we go. I mean, interesting time in the middleweight division with Gegard Mousasi on top, Austin Vandenberg perhaps in line. Who might be next? And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome our next fighter making his way to the cage, Javier Torres. We think of so many great boxers that have come from Mexico, from that Sonora, Mexico area. It has not yet become a hotbed of MMA, but Javier Torres relocated right near here to Chandler, Arizona. And although he's 0-2 inside the Bellator cage, Demon Gracie and Andre Fiela, that's about as tough a strength of schedule walk into Bellator as you can have a win. Yeah, we're we're going to give you a supreme grappler where yeah. you know, Javier Torres is a good grappler. We're going to give you a supreme one, and then we're going to give you a supreme striker. Javier Torres is a very solid fighter. He's good everywhere. He's just in that position where he's been matched up with guys that are just superior in that skill set where they end up getting the win against him. But he's a tough individual who comes to scrap. He's good on the ground. He's good on his feet. He gives people problems throughout the fight. Comes from a boxing legacy, and he is happy to be back in the cage again. Another victim of everything being shut down. His first fight. A couple of years. Looking for his first win since June of 2019. I think our cut man already poked him in the eye. What a great start. It's not our cut man, it was the Vaseline, but if you the one thing that you will notice. Javier's got a very unique color for his hair tonight. That's based upon his wife having to color someone else's hair, not being sure that the purple was going to be right, so she tested it on her husband. That's next level research right there. <laughs> and now his opponent ready to make his way to the cage, the Arubian assassin, Gregory Midian. Make a list of the top athletes from Aruba. We're talking about baseball players: Sidney Ponson, Xander Bogarts, uh, Red Sox. Really, a large, great story about him 
worked at the Marriott at the Champions as a waiter. Now his picture's up on the wall because of his success in MMA. And he knows a little about Julius Angles since he was in with him last time out. This is exactly it. it. But he has moved down in weight to what is more his natural weight of 185. He went up just to take that fight because it was his chance to get into Bellator. I don't blame him for it. Put up a hard three round fight against a very big and strong person in Anglixcus. But Gregory Millar, very good ground game. He's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's got good Dutch kickboxing. He's a solid fighter. He's got one weakness. His wrestling is still it's improving. And you need to be in that position where you can stop guys who are trying to take him down. Come out there, Doris. We're trying to throw him into the car. Imagine being a natural one in your five room and you go up with two little five. That's not 135 to 145, 145 to 155. You're going up to 205 and ain't going to hang on. Just like a monster. Exactly. You're talking about a guy who, it, you know, when he walks in the cage on the night of the fight, is probably 225 to 230 pounds. Check out the tail of the tape. Our tail of the tape for this middleweight fight, which is a beautiful thing for Gregory Billiard. He's got a big reach advantage, 76.5. Like I said, he likes to stand on the outside and use that Dutch kick box. Tonight from downtown Phoenix here at Footprint Center, Bellator 268 prelims now feature three five minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot two, weighing in 184.3 pounds. His professional record: 11 wins, five losses. By way of Ciudad Obregón, Sonora, Mexico, he fights out of Phoenix, Arizona. Happy here. And across the cage is adversary. He fights out of the red corner at six foot weighing in 184.6 pounds as a professional. 12 victories, six losses from Chocolate City, Aruba, the Aruba Assassin, Gregory Billion. In charge, drug free, Jason Herzog. boxing fights in Mexico. He fights as the father of two girls, his youngest daughter. He's had six surgeries, brain surgeries. He has clear-cut purpose when he gets back inside the cage. One of the things that Javier Torres has going for him in this matchup, being a southpaw against the orthodox style of Milliard, is that rear kick. He brings that up, that's going to the liver. He lands that thing cleanly, he can do a lot of damage. The off stances can give you a very, very awkward fight or a classic fight. Absolutely. <laughs> Rarely in between. And there's a lot of things that go on. It's that foot placement. Take a look at the right foot of Torres against the left foot of Milliard. When you get that foot to the outside, you're making it to where you have a clean shot down the middle and your opponent has to actually twist their body to try to land theirs. That's why you see Torres, see him stepping off to his right. That's to step outside of Milliard's lead foot. Nice body shot by Gregory. Take that hand, grab to the foot, left hand. Torres has found a great place to settle in at the MMA lab with John Crouch. Very flat footed. Very little motion. Really, are really looking to load up on that right hand. He's looking for that opening so he can land it. Calling for 
Instead of just start touching your opponent with shots, they will add up and a big one will come. Isn't that a style that's being that's a little more passe now because it's just harder and harder to catch better trained fighters with one shot? That, you know, that, that, it's that, that one shot mentality is never a good game plan because you're looking for something that can just pass you by. That opportunity could be there. If you don't hit it, it goes by and it never comes back. So putting volume on your opponent, that volume will open up more opportunities for that one big strike. Take Avin again. <laughs> Evolution. A nice body lock. Familiar. He's got him pressed up at this cage. He should take his time, bounce him off, look to bring him backside. I mean, backside. Come to his left. Trap that. Take your left leg. Trap the right leg of Torres and swing him off to your left side. He's just about to say, what is Torres trying to do here? Is he looking for that outside trip? And obviously, that's what he was doing. Torres can be really dangerous here, but as you can see, not a lot of time left in the round. And Milliard had the underhook, and that's what he was able to use to get himself back to his feet. Through one. We haven't had very many rounds to score, period, let alone tough ones to score. Through five fights tonight, we have had two round twos and no round threes. This is kind of night you like. Well, depending on which side you're yeah. Yeah. Ha Javi, you're kind of stuck there watching. You need to keep circling right. Let me see that. You heard constantly throughout round one, keep circling, keep circling, and Javier Torres wasn't really doing it. You know, it happens in the middle of a fight. You have an opponent that's at that distance, and you start, you, you'll find yourself, all of a sudden, you're starting to slow your movement down, your feet become dead on the mat. You don't want that to happen. That's why his corner's telling him, I need you to keep circling. So who won that first round? You know, I, I would say that, you know, Javier Torres probably got the win, landed some good shots. He had that kick in the early part of the round that landed was clean, but it's a close round. But that's when you are in those corners, don't tell your opponent, oh, you won that round. I mean, you're, you're a fighter, you won that round, because you never know which way the judge is going to go. Fans love the spinning back fist. Even when they're not even close. Long two, long two. Even if it looks like one of those Steven Seagal videos. Long two. Nice straight. Left hand down the pipe by Javier. To start listening to his corner, that movement, stepping to the outside of that foot, that's going to put that left hand in a position to go straight in between the hands of Billion. Yeah, 
and surely you have seen your share of fighters I don't say ignoring the corner and almost getting back and saying, I'm, you know, I'm out there. I'm seeing something you're not seeing. I mean, there has to be a moment. You wonder what's going through the mind of Javier Torres. He's clearly comfortable doing what he's doing. Well, no doubt about it, but you watch it. Miller's having problems just with every time. He's the one that's closing the distance and trying to actually push this towards the cage wall, but he's not coming away with it. Everything that Miller yeah. is bringing, you can see that he sees it coming, he anticipates it, he flows well with it, he's just got to land the counters. Right now, Torres should switch this up to a single. He cannot get his hands clasped behind Billiard based upon the spread of the legs. So start to switch it. Chain these techniques together. The cool thing about these prelims, being able to hear the corners so clearly. So, the corners are so different. The styles are so different. Yeah, you'll hear a lot of high energetic banter by some, and they sound very calm, very low key, but giving good advice throughout the, throughout the round. Torres just made a mistake and he's watching him, allowing him to get those double underhooks. Not a good position. He's out of here. Torres seems to be gaining confidence here as we move along. Which comes from being able to see everything coming. Now the circle. Miller keeps on giving that same thing, but he's not throwing off. He's backed into the cage a few times, and then Torres just spins out because he's not giving him anything to think about. I think Miller's getting a little frustrated. That look, there's no doubt you can see clearly he's the faster fighter. Yeah. But he's not been able to cleanly touch Javier Torres throughout this fight. Torres listens, he's trying to find knees to the inside. Again, yeah, gives up the end of those double unders. But right now, Miller needs it where he's got his hands. Never put your hands, if you get double unders, you don't want them in the middle of the back. I want my hands down low to the hips or up high towards the shoulders. That oh, sir. is a swing and a miss. A lot of watching, a lot of waiting. Not a lot of shots landed in this fight. You go back to those two kicks, one up high. But yeah, it was blocked as far as the arm, but it still hey, rattled the cage a little bit of Greg, Gregory Milliard as far as he feels it, and then it was a good kick in return to the body that Torres landed. So, coming up at 10 o'clock Eastern, we go live on Showtime. We are headed for the semifinals of the light heavyweight Grand Prix, including the world title fight between Vadim Nemkov and Julius Angliskas. Ryan Bader back home in Phoenix. He's fought a few hours from here many, many years ago, but this place is going to erupt when he walks into the building. And what many people are calling the fight of the weekend against Corey Anderson, Benson Henderson and Brent Primus feel like their fight should be for the light, vacant lightweight world title, not the fight in two weeks in Dublin between Peter Grilly and the Tricky Pitbull. Henry Corrales kicks off the main card. There's always fireworks. Which we have yet to see here. 
That was a nice catch and, sw and sweep of the leg by Torres. He wasn't able to land a counter off of it. That's what you're looking for with that technique. See him sweeping that arm through. Again, he gets where he wants to get. He's been able to get there from this position twice. Good head position right now by Javier Torres. Keeping his head in tight, controlling the head position of Billiard. Torres has been able to hold him against the fence like this. The danger of those numbers is what, how you define land. Well, and also which ones land with power. Right. And that's the whole point. Because I'll give I think the yard has landed more. Torres is the one that has landed with the more power. When it comes to the kids. For me, anyway, I have no earthly idea how the judges are seeing this. Two plus rounds. It could literally be either way. Both guys should feel like they need to put everything out. I've got to do something to make a difference in this round. Let the judges know that I'm the one trying to put an end to this fight. Fight, loading up, loading up. Where's my one shot? Where's my one shot? Yeah, but the, the big problem with that load up is you can see it. And Torres is seeing it every time you see him do a nice little roll through that. Little head position change continues to make Hilliard miss his shots. Fans don't like it, but Torres has to feel good about controlling his position for much of the round. Fans got a little spoiled, I think, to the first five fights. Javier Feely has tried to, try to pull him off of that cage. Just started to pull him like, oh, that work. How many times have we seen Millier get those double underhooks? He has not been able to get Torres' back on the ground. You said this fight isn't going to be on the ground at all. You'd say well, that's bad news for Javier Torres, but not the way it's played out. Well, at the start of it, we talked about, you know, where they were strong, and both of them black belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But the one thing about Milliard was his wrestling was something that he's working on. He's getting better at it, but it's still not at that point where he can utilize the techniques that he needs to put someone where he wants him to be. Milliard comes forward, misses, and Torres pushes him up against the fence. In the first 14 minutes. Still up for grabs. Got that kick a couple of times. Both guys need to just put it all out right now. No way. Both need to act as if they are behind, yet both have fought as if they are ahead. Yep. They will leave it in the hands of the judges.
So you watch these three rounds, like I watched them. Are you leaning towards Torres because of those first couple of rounds? Did Millard do enough? Were, were we seeing it backwards? Did both guys do what they want to do and it just didn't translate? Well, we're going to find out if it's a lot better. Yeah, I, mean, I would tell you that Javier Torres, in my opinion, had the cleaner strikes. And really, there was no ground attack at all throughout this, although we did have grappling up against the cage and the clinch. But the striking is what was the predominant action of the fight. And so, who had the cleaner strikes? In my opinion, it was Javier Torres. Great tradition of the Mexican luchador mask, donned by Javier Torres. And if he just, if he just put his gloves down, he did. He did. At age 36. Might be the end. Javier Torres saying farewell. Will he say farewell as a winner? Well, Michael C. Williams knows the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at Cape Sun. Your first judge, Michael Bell, scores the fight 29 28. He sees the fight for Milliard. Your second judge, Eric Curcio, scores the fight 29 28. He sees the fight for Torres. Your third and final judge at Cape Side, Ron McCarthy, scores the fight 29 to 28. With the winner by split decision, Javier Torres. We said it was close. We said it was hard to judge. We thought it would come down to a split decision, and it did. And as it turns out, a storybook ending to the 12-year career of Javier Torres. Every language, that means the same thing. I'm good. It does. It's a nice thing to see. It's a nice thing to see Javier Torres walks out in that last fight with a win. We head upstairs to the fight desk in Jen Brown. Well, thanks, Sean. Javier Torres getting it done there. Impressive performance. All right, here's another look at our four-fight main card coming up on Showtime. Now, we will close out the semifinals of our light heavyweight Grand Prix. Ryan Bader, he's taken on Corey Anderson. We've also got the champ, Adi Nemkov. He's putting his belt on the line against Julius and Glitzkus. Plus, we've got the former lightweight champ, Ren Premis. He's looking to reestablish himself in the division with a big win over Benson Henderson. And to break this one down, we're going to check back in with Gareth A. Davies. Benson Henderson and Brent Primus face each other in a lightweight matchup, pitching two former champions in an intriguing clash of styles. Henderson is known as smooth for a reason, training out of the MMA lab with John Crouch and a true spiritual scientist of the sport. He last fought here when the Showtime Anthony Pettis kick reverberated around the world and cost him the contest. Henderson acknowledges that it will be a challenge here against the former champion Primus, who, meanwhile, feels aggrieved after his last fight with Islam Mamadov. I agree with him. He told me, I should have let my hands fly. I really think I could have knocked him out. I thought he won that contest. That's why I'm so excited about this Benson Henderson fight, because he brings it, and they will produce the fight of the night. Primus, if he wins, will call for the belt and he deserves another shot, in my view. Well, a lot of people did feel that Primus won that last fight against Islam. I know, Josh, you and I talked about that. Uh, tonight, he's going to fight just two and a half months after that last fight, and that's not the norm for Brent Primus. Usually, he's about a one-fight-a-year kind of guy. So how might that affect his performance, or what might we see different from him uh, with this quick turnaround? I think what that performance did was a little fire under his butt and made him say, hey, you know what? I gotta get my act together and start to get back out there. Look, what he needs to do 
is he has a chain of submissions, which we all know. He hits the Goma Plata here on Tim Wilde, and after that, he makes transitions from that to the to the Oma Plata. Then he sometimes will get to the back from that position as well, or he'll sweep to get to the top position. All of those things are great off of your back, but for him to win this fight, he needs to make sure that he is on top. He is strong, he's dominant, he's got great jiu-jitsu. I think if he's able to put Benson Henderson on his back, he could have a successful night. His overall size, and like I said, his strength, I will think will be a huge factor along with the, his top-level jiu-jitsu. Let's talk Benson for a moment. Uh, you know, he's he's a legend. We said it earlier. He's been a champ in the other two organizations. He's the former WEC champ, former UFC champ. He came here wanting to win a third title. He has come up short uh, in a couple of fights. How important is it for him to get a win tonight? It's very important because he is getting older, and I've been there in that situation where you're like, hey, this is kind of my last chance to make my run. They call him smooth for a reason because he is smooth. He does everything really well. He doesn't do one thing great. See, a lot of people are just one-trick ponies still somewhat in this MMA world, which is crazy because he is so good on the feet. He grabs great leg kicks. He puts together his combinations. He's someone that can do everything. We saw him going out of Piccolotti earlier in the, in the highlights. He's great on the ground, the good transitions. He fights out of a lot of great positions. He put it together against Miles Jury on the feet. He is so talented, but this could potentially be his last chance and opportunity to get on a run to get to a title shot. Well, he does sit in that number three spot in the rankings. Brent Primus, not even in the top ten. I know you have questions about that. Uh, but one thing is for sure, Sean, a lot is on the line for both of these fighters, and they are looking to make a big statement with a big win tonight. I don't think there's any question, and that is puzzling because Brent Primus, yeah, early in his career, he was not active. He was fighting once a year, but now he has been more active, obviously coming off a loss, but he is a former champion. He only has those two losses, and 155 is an interesting place to be right now with Patricio Pitbull, the champion, taking himself out of the mix. We'll have a new champion. We'll likely have a new number one contender. Cindy Outlaw is going to want to have something to say about this, and this is a name you might want to remember in Nick Brown as we're about to see him in this next fight. He is a hot fighter, the champion down in Legacy, coming up to Bellator here, and an interesting test for him. And now, on his way to the cage, Bobby Lee. And that's because Bobby Lee is gonna test you. A young fighter who, to his credit, John, doesn't mind taking high-level fights. We saw him against Soren Bach. I mean, this guy is still 25 years old. Soren Bach was the last guy to beat Patty Pimblett, and Bobby Lee stayed in there with him for most of the yeah! fight. And he is, Woo! as you see, a high-energy young man from Minnesota, and he's happy to learn the lessons of facing top fighters, knowing it's going to pay off for him later. Like, I, I say he's just far more tough. He is very reminiscent of a Matt Hughes, a yeah, guy that's super strong, good wrestling, just very, very physically tough. Bobby Lee is not an easy out for anyone. And Joey Davis came in, and Joey is a phenomenal wrestler. And went three rounds with Joey D Davis, and then in his last fight, you take a look, Soren Bach, is, as you said, he has been on a tear. This is a guy who is amazing on the ground. Could not get rid of Bobby Lee. Bobby Lee was there the whole time. So Bobby just needs to get that that extra push. He needs to be a little more offensive, not have someone that's putting him on the defensive. And he's got that ability in this fight with Nick Brown tonight. And now his opponent making his way, Nick Nightwell. Always keep your eye out for the guys who are winning at the regional level and NyQuil Nick Brown wasn't just winning, he was starting to dominate. He won four in a row, lightweight champion, legacy. He actually has a 25 second knockout win over the aforementioned Sydney Outlaw that happened in what's now PFL a while ago. So his credentials have been building up and building up. He's got a wrestling background. He actually went to wrestle in college and really fell in love with boxing. As it turns out, he's found a livelihood where he gets to combine all those things. Look, on the mat, this guy's good. His jiu-jitsu is good. He sets people up for those submissions where he forces them in the direction that he wants him to go. His wrestling is good. His hands are good. He's got the whole game. 
So when you're looking at Nick Brown, you're going, man, that's a handful to deal with. You've got to be very careful in the cage with Nick Brown, especially when you go to the ground with him. Bobby Lee still doing cartwheels in front of us. Is that a, uh, is that a good use of energy? Before the fight, let's check out the tail of the tape, which does not include acrobatics. It's real simple. As you said, legacy fighting champion at the lightweight division at 11 and 1 for Nick Brown. Bobby Lee, 12 and 6. He has been the guy who has fought some tough dudes. We'll see if he can get through Nick Brown here tonight. And for those that may have just joined us late night live in the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you to Bellator 268 prelims here in Phoenix, Arizona, as we go now to three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 156.8 pounds. His professional record: 12 wins, six losses, fighting out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, Bobby. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 155.3 pounds as a professional, nearly perfect. 11 wins, one defeat, fighting out of Uniontown, Pennsylvania, Nick Nyquil Brown. Your referee in charge, Mike Beltran. Uniontown, Pennsylvania, about 45 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Brown calls home. Stop! Stop! You good? I'm good. Okay, let's go. Pick him up. Let's go. Fight! Wait, what, what do you have to do to Bobby Lee? Referee, Frank Dalton, you good? Forced him into it. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to say to that? <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how Bobby Lee attacks in this fight because when you're looking at it, he comes from a wrestling background, but does he want to end up going to the ground with Nick Brown? Or does he want to say, you know, I'm going to use my wrestling, keep this on the field, and try to hurt him with my hands? It seems. Oh, good shot. Beautiful straight right hand. Look at the smile on Nick Brown's face. He knows. See, this is what happens. You get hit, and right away you go right back. To what wrong here? Use it, use Which is the wrestling. Bobby Lee watching the last fight, as we called it, against Soren Bach. Watching him now, listening to him talk. You almost feel like it's a good strong takedown. He needs that. He needs more discipline in his coaching. He needs to find that one place where he's going to get that high level. He needs to be very careful here. He's got a knee bar coming. And he's left looking towards. Yeah, we got a problem here. That's trouble. He's, he's got, got a big problem. Both heel hook and knee bar. That is bad. He's got both and we're done. It's, he's got skill. He's got will, but he gets careless, and he did there clearly. Well, he got clipped in the stand-up, and like, you know, you have this game plan, and the game plan is, I'm going to try to keep this on the feet, which I thought he would. But when he gets hurt, he reverts right back to what is his base. His base is wrestling, and I said, when he goes to the ground with Nick Brown, good job on your and part. he is good down there. He's dangerous, and you saw how quickly he put that submission on. This is what changed it. Whatever game plan Bobby Lee had. Watch the right hand. Boom. That's a solid shot right there to the side of the chin. So I'm sorry, the side of the jaw and the ear. And then when he takes him down, now Nick Brown rolls in for that knee bar. Not only does he lock in the knee bar, watch him step over with that. He grabs that foot and he starts torquing that heel over. That's one, now yeah, you're one, getting that's it both ways. That is a nasty submission hold. Beautiful. Look at how, look at that leg. It is not bowing in the right direction. Beautiful submission by Nick Brown. That's what you want to see from a fighter like Nick Brown. 
trying to make his name in Bellator in his Bellator debut and get on the list at 155. Bobby Lee was going to make mistakes and he made one and Nick Brown made him pay. Half of Nick Brown's 12 wins has now come by submission. Michael C. Williams has all the information. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes by way of the heel hook. Official time, one minute, 38 seconds. Round number one by submission, Nick Nyquil. Nick Brown impresses in his Bellator debut. He's with John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with your winner, Nick Nyquil. That was definitely Nyquil like Brown. That was a beautiful submission. Bobby Lee is a very tough individual. Went three rounds with Joey Davis and then three rounds with Soren Bach. And you immediately came in here, landed good, clean shots that made him revert back to his wrestling putting you in a position on the mat where you are so tough and so good. Yeah, that's what we've been working on, standing up, getting him off his game, you know, into our game, standing on the ground. First, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without him, none of this would be possible. I want to thank everybody in here for coming. You guys are the reason we do this. I want to thank Bellator, my coach Isaac, AJ, All-American, my factory, Kama Worthy. You know, he's giving me the confidence for this. Pittsburgh MMA is on the map. Next week, we're taking over a couple other promotions, but we're here, and I love it, guys. Thank you. Let's talk about the transition into you rolled into that knee bar and actually went with a heel hook knee bar combination. Which one do you think was putting more pressure on him? Uh, I had the heel hook as about as far as I could go. I didn't have any oh. pressure to twist with my hips. They were locked underneath of him. So I kept the heel hook, and I just kept hipping into the ground. So I, I believe it was more knee bar, but, you know, if he would have rolled through, I would have kept the... Kept the uh, foot lock and, you know, rolled with and submitted wherever you went. What? This is your first debut fight in Bellator. You put on an incredible performance. Welterweight division. What do you want next? Um, you know, I, another guy came here from the LFA. I'd love to, you know, unify that, you know, we both came as champions. You know, there needs to be one all the way up to, you know, Bellator goals. You know, that's, that's my goal is to the top. And no one's going to stand in my way. So who is that guy? Jaleel Willis? Um, I think Bryce Logan. Bryce Logan. Well, it sounds good to me. That was a beautiful performance. Outstanding submission. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mr. NyQuil, Nick Brown. That is how you make immediate impact. Nick Brown in his Bellator debut. We are closing in on 10 o'clock Eastern. We are closing in on the semifinals of the light heavyweight Grand Prix. It will end tonight with a main event and a title fight a month ago we couldn't possibly have imagined as Vadim Nemkov, who has been dominant, he has been at world championship level, but tonight he goes in for the first time as the heavy fan. The Lucas is just a stud when it comes to the stand-up. He just keeps coming forward. He's got great wrestling defense, and he just starts putting a beating on his opponents. And this is what we're down to, the final four in the light heavyweight Grand Prix, which tonight will go down to two. So many people talking about Ryan Bader and Corey Anderson, but that is the world title fight between the alternate Julius Anglicus and Vadim Nemkov, who is going to step out of the shadows here at some point. So a little history lesson. Let's go back to New Year's 2015. You were in the ring at Saitama Super Arena. I was ringside, and we watched Vadim Nemkov against Yuri Prochaska. He was undefeated at that time, and Vadim Nemkov lost that fight. 
because John, he was so exhausted after beating him up for 10 minutes because they had the 10 minute round, 10 minute round one. That was his first loss. He hadn't managed his gas tank at that point, and he actually lost the fight because he just got too tired from beating the other guy up. And this is what we talk about learning how to fight. It's not just the techniques, it's learning the pace. When you need to back off, breathe a little bit, get your air back, and then come back in the fight. That was a 10 minute round in Japan. And if you're looking at it, eight minutes of it went to Nemkov, easy. So you still have to learn, and he has learned how to be a fighter. This fight right here, this was his first fight, a three round fight against Bill Davis, where he looked fantastic in the first two rounds. But the third round, he had problems because he started to get tired. And we wondered, is it gonna be when he gets into the championship rounds, but Dean Nemkov has a problem with his cardio? And he has actually proved to us he has now learned how to be a fighter that understands pacing, understands when to go, when to sit back, and now he can take those five rounds and finish them off easy. So disciplined in everything he does, but he may need the five rounds tonight because Julius Angliskas is a guy, you know, Vadim Nemkov will touch you. Angliskas is hard to hit. And Glixis is very tight with his defense, which is beautiful to see when you're watching him because he is incredibly strong, but he's basic. He's basic with his straight shots when he throws. His wrestling is good. He's got good wrestling defense, and he doesn't take a lot of damage in the fight. He's a tough, tough nut to crack because he doesn't overextend a lot. Look at how nice and calm he is here. Just throws his hand, doesn't try to load up on the shots, but this is what makes him dangerous. Look at that beautiful right hand. Knee to the inside. Again, controlling the distance, doesn't sit there, and he sees, he sees when he hits him with a good shot, but he doesn't rush in. He just takes his time and keeps methodically breaking his opponent down. But when he had someone that he thought, oh, you know what, you're gonna give me problems on the feet, I will utilize my wrestling and I will take you to the ground. This is what we're talking about with Anglicus. He can get into a fight and control where the fight is at. That is a big element in fighting. And so he's gonna he's gonna cause or present problems for Nemkov that Nemkov is gonna definitely have to deal with. He's a giant 205er and he is playing with house money tonight with Betty Nemkov for the first time going in as the heavy favorite. That's a position he has not really been in very often. Well, two weeks ago, we saw the number one contender fight at 170. Talk about prospects at that level, at that weight class. You're going to see two of them go head to head in a huge fight at 170. And now, his way to the cage, Muhammad Berhomo. 13 0 is a great place to be. 776 days away from the cage is not. And Luke Mudd. Burmoff has been very impressed. We see this is another win. Two more regional welterweight champions here going head to head. And we've talked about opponents falling through. There's a lot of reasons you don't get to fight, but at the end of the day, you're going into a very important fight and a high level fight trying to shake off that rust. Look, I've been in the cage with Burmoff in Russia. I can tell you. This guy is good and good everywhere. He's got outstanding wrestling. His stand-up is very good. Good power in his hands. I can't say why he's been out of the game for quite this amount of time. The one thing I can tell you is you've got a real fighter in this kid. Tricky, dangerous fighter on the ground has multiple wins, rolling for arm bars. He's a fun fighter. Google him. He's a fun fighter to watch on video. And of course, like everything, like Forrest Gump, you'll see Big John in some of the. Curious. <laughs> <laughs> Every MMA. Makes, oh look, there's Big John. Kind of like where's Waldo? Russia, Kazakhstan. <laughs> like, there he is. Got a lot of air miles there. But you know, the, the one part about when I was able to do all that, I was able to see fighters like Berkhoff here and see how good the talent out there across the world was. And you, you know, you can say what you want about who's the best or anything. All I can tell people is there are great fighters across the globe. And now to Leo, the real head.
Well, the last time of Rampage, you don't really think of Memphis, Tennessee as being a hotbed. Maybe Jaleel Willis is going to change that on his six-fight win streak. Another legacy champion. Trying to bring his success here into Bellator, where he has won all three of his fights, and it's uh, been a pretty impressive 3-0. Well, I will tell you that Jalil Willis has it all. He's a good athlete. He's got wrestling. That's where his base came from. But he has learned how to be a very good and relaxed stand-up fighter, which a lot of wrestlers, they're not relaxed in the stand-up. They press and they push too much. Jalil Willis has used his time to become outstanding in the stand-up. This is a kid with power, good wrestling. This matchup right here is as good as it gets. This is Jaleel Willis right here. This is against Mendoza. Look at that takedown. Look at the pressure he puts. He is a very strong individual. He can put you where you want in the fight. And when he decides to land shots, usually they're big, heavy shots. That's a big right hand. Those break you down. Mendoza was in a position. He's going after him. Willis tagged him too many times. Again, the takedown, that wrestling ability makes Jaleel Willis very dangerous. Let's check out the tail of the tape here as we move to 170. As simple as it gets, 15 and 2 for Jalil Willis, and I will tell you, one of those should never be there. He was fouled by a fighter, and they gave him a loss wrong. 13 and 0 for Berkamoff. This is a matchup made in heaven. It might be for a spot in the top 10 as well to Michael C. Williams. Tonight here in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, the prelims here from Tour 268 continue. Now with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing first out of the blue corner. At six foot weighing in, 170.7 pounds. Making his long anticipated Bellator debut, he brings an undefeated professional record. 13 wins, no defeats. He fights out of Baksan, Russia, Muhammad Birhamo. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner. At 5 foot 11, weighing in 169.9 pounds. As a professional, 14, pardon me, 15 victories, just two defeats. He fights out of North Memphis, Tennessee, Jaleel, the real Willis. In charge of the action referee, Ryan Brueggemann. John, the last couple of months coming off the very long layoffs because of COVID and other reasons. Has there been a common theme between them? You get over anxious timing. Well, we walk into a shot, the opening seconds is what happens. There you go. And, and it's really, it's the timing of a real fight, how fast it is compared to your training. And so it is something that you want to be comfortable with, you want to get used to it. That's why when a lot of people talk about ring rust, it's the speed of the fight that you're talking about. Some Russia, southwest part of Russia, about 200 miles north of Lisi, the Georgian capital. I'm not as familiar with Russian geography as Big John. <laughs> but look at the one thing you want to see right now. Look at Brokemoff and look at the leg position. You saw how we put feet on the hips. You saw him space equals escape. When you have close proximity and you're down, it's, there's no escape right now. But if you can create space, you can create that escape situation. If he's trying right now, to, he's trying for an Ezekiel choke. You see him, he's got the arm on top. Doesn't mean he's going to get it, but you saw that fist. He's making like a baseball, sticking it into the throat area of Jalil Willis. Try to shake him off right here. Just keep shaking a little bit at a time. You see that weight coming sideways. Nice reverse of position by both Bob. On top, I can tell 
you, this guy is dominating in the position. He's very hard to move, heavy hips, and he lands big shots. First thing he tried to do is trap Jalen Wilson's right arm with that knee. Still thinking about it. See, he mentioned that his left knee up. Either step over into mount or to pin that arm. See, yeah, once you look, a lot of guys will just sit in the half guard position because they like this up against the cage. They feel very dominant. They feel good that they can't be moved. He's going to always be working to move that position into a better place where he can either land the submission or hit him with big shots. <laughs> Very little room for Willis to work out of this. <laughs> so he gives the back up and see if he can get himself back to his feet. You hear his corner talk about working the hands because Bergamoff is in that position. Hands clasped together in the gable grip. Very strong from that position. So if you can break the hands, it's going to give you an opportunity to get out. Some people who Dan Gable would. <laughs> Dan Gable being 1972 Olympic gold medalist from the United States. Went almost undefeated in college. One of the greatest American wrestlers of all time. One of the greatest coaches. Also. He was. Younger people would know him for that. Bob has definitely changed this around. He's the one dominating the positions, landing the shots. Nothing real big, but just working towards right here. Looking at this right here. That is tight. That is trouble. He's in a bad spot. It's over. Burhala just kept looking for different things to do from that spot. He had so many clubs in his bag to use from there. And this is what I'm talking about when I say, look at this guy's dangerous. This is what I saw when I was refereeing him. He doesn't just settle. He's always looking to move to a better position or a better, better submission setup. The guy is just a phenomenal fighter. And just subbed a guy in the first round that had never been subbed in an eight-year career. Yep. Talk about how many of his submission wins, and this is his ninth in 14 pro fights, have come by rolling for arm bars, by rolling, by continuing to improve his position Watch this. and looking for other things. Watch the setup right there. He takes that right arm and he slides it over the top and then brings it over. Look at the pressure. It's because of the cage and the body position. Look at where Willis's right arm is. It's across his neck. It's just creating another force of pressure. Beautiful submission by Burkwell. There was a moment earlier in the early in the fight when it looked like Jaleel Willis was in a strong position and Burmoff was almost completely unimpressed by it. Says it was almost looked to his corner, say, don't worry, I got this. And as Michael C. Williams will tell you, he did. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes by way of a guillotine choke officially. Four minutes, five seconds into round number one by submission. Still undefeated, Mohamed Bravo. Fourteen and oh, 11 of them stoppages. Said there was a place in the top ten for the winner. Going to be hard to deny him now. He's with John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with your winner, Mukhamed Burkhamov. That was an incredibly impressive performance against a guy that we all know is an outstanding fighter. How did it feel coming into this cage for the first time after he'd been on a long layoff? Это был очень серьезный соперник, и ты показал э, впечатляющий бой. Мы очень э, впечатлены. И расскажи, как прошел этот бой. Бой пошел вообще не, по, не так, как я планировал, потому что я хотел 
поработать чуть в стойке. Но подсказку здесь и раньше времени начал бороться. Я люблю бороться, и э, не надо было ему этого делать. Uh, it went a little bit not like I planned, because in the beginning I slipped a little, so it had to go to the ground. But I was planning to stand up with him in the beginning, but uh, it went to the ground, and uh, you don't want to be on the ground with me. So this was your first time fighting in the United States. Did that pose any problems, or did you feel good coming here for the first time. Это был твой бой здесь в Америке. Ты как ты себя чувствовал здесь? Как твой первый бой прошел? Расскажи, как ты готовился. Это был первый бой, конечно, но я до этого хочу принести извинения всей организации Белата, что я до этого провалил свой вес. И я здесь, я здесь тренируюсь, пока живу, и мне здесь комфортно. А так были волнения и uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, sorry to Bellator because the first fight that I was supposed to fight, I missed my weight. But this time everything went great. I felt great. Uh, I felt confident. It was perfect. Let's talk about the submission in the end. That was a beautiful setup. You went for the arm, bringing your arm through for the guillotine, and you trapped his arm against the cage. When you set that hand up, did he know that he had it? Uh, расскажи про этот болевой, это был очень красивый болевой. Ты uh, зажал его руку, расскажи, как uh, ты подготовил этот болевой. Ну, я его особо не готовлю. Uh, я люблю работать возле сетки, возле в моем зале. Я всегда это делаю и просто попался. Ничего такого я не сделал. Uh, I didn't really plan it, but I like working next to the cage, uh, and uh, this what I do. I just go with the flow. I didn't really plan it. I just went with the flow and I did it. Well, I would say that was a beautiful performance. Congratulations. Welcome to Bellator. That was a big win against someone who's never been submitted. Хотел бы поблагодарить свою команду во главе с Генри Хуфтом, Грег Джонсон, все тренера, всем спасибо. Все, кто за меня болеет, всем спасибо. Адгасаков Псо. He wanted to say thank you to his coach, Henry Hooft, uh, to his team. And everyone who supported him, who came out here and back home, everyone who supported him, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mukhamed Berkhamov. Mukhamed Berkhamov moving to 14-0, getting it done tonight inside the Bellator cage for his Bellator debut, looking fantastic. All right, well, we've got more prelim action coming your way in just a few. The hits keep coming on Showtime. You don't want no trouble. 40 fight nights a year. Oh, what a shot! Four hard-hitting series. What a phenomenal finish! When the lights and cameras on, he hit hard. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. Showtime, the home of combat sports. Hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. The light heavyweight throne is closer than ever. Reigning champ Vadim Nemkov looks unstoppable. Just like that. But striker Julius Angliscus will stop at nothing for his title shot. I want you to know my name. Plus, Ryan Darth Vader is on a mission to reclaim the belt. What a knockout! Against the devastating ground game of Corey Anderson. Ground the light heavyweight World Grand Prix semifinals. Live tonight at 10 on Showtime, where warriors rule. Ryan Vader. One of the elite amongst the elite in all of this game. Oh, big shot! It is all over! You've got the best blast double in the sport. Big oh, shots here. Could he finish it? Right here, right now. Just like that! Ryan Bader! 
said this, I'm gonna take them down, I'm gonna ground and pound, I'm gonna get my arm raised. Ground and pound! Anderson just dropping those nasty elbows. It is all over! Corey Anderson, victorious! Well, Bellator 268 continues here at the Footprint Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Incredible crowd out there with some fantastic fights so far. All right, well, tonight Ryan Bader will continue his quest to regain his champ champ status, but he will have a very tough opponent tonight in Corey Anderson. Now, Josh, you said in order for Corey to win tonight, he needs to go out and just be himself. What does that look like? Well, he's had problems in the past when he's not himself, but when he is himself and he does all the things that we know he is capable of doing, he's probably won one of the most, if not the most talented fighter in the 205 pound division. If he sticks behind his jab, he sets up his kicks behind his jab. He uses all of those weapons right there to help set up his takedowns. It uses that speed and it all leads to what? Ground and pound, baby. That's really what it comes down to. I'm telling you, his ground and pound is some of the nastiest in the game, but he's got to do all those things beforehand to get to this right here as you see against Yags. If he does that, I'm saying that stiff jab and that kick, all that leads to that ground and pound, and that ground and pound is where he makes his living. He is nasty on top, probably the best in the game when he gets to that top position. Well, he's also known for his cardio. Now, in the past, in the last few years at least, Brian Bader's known for being the fastest guy, you know, the faster guy, especially coming from heavyweight. Is that going to be the case, though, tonight? When Absolutely not. Yeah. No. <laughs> No, Corey Anderson's the faster fighter. He's uh, got a longer reach, three and a half, reach, three and a half inch reach advantage. Um, he will be the faster fighter. He is a slight, slightly bit taller than him, an inch taller. All of those li little things, when you're talking the top levels, Corey's gonna have the advantage, but I give the power to Ryan Bader. Uh, the blast double that Big John was talking about earlier, he's got probably the best blast double in the game. And what he does well is when he bullies people around that, that cage, He's impressive. And if he can bully Corey Anderson to stick a, take a step backwards, I think that'll open up that blast double. With Machida, he was able to touch him with the hands, get in deep on the takedowns, and hit that blast double. When he gets on top, he's almost exactly like a Corey Anderson. When they get on top, they have good top control position, and the ground and pound is vicious. He is nasty and good. That's why he was the champ champ. He just needs to go out there and believe he cannot afford to take a step backwards. If he does, Corey Anderson will run away with this fight. Uh, speed versus power. It's got all the makings for an intense and fantastic co-main event tonight. I'm looking forward to this one. I'm pumped for it. The reason why is because we've seen that we've seen all the back and forth about the training sessions. But guess what? It's finally here. We're gonna actually find out who the better fighter is. And let's not forget, uh, it's in front of a hometown crowd here that favors Ryan Bader. Um, hey, I heard that we've got um, a special guest down there with Big John and Sean. Are you guys, oh, look who it is, uh, Jensen. You, <laughs> you get a world champion up there. Now we have a world yes, champion like down it. here, and Juan Archuleta. Who we're gonna talk about bantamweight. We're gonna talk about what might be in the future. But you know what? We we were just watching that, talking about Ryan Bader and Corey Anderson, and I've been wondering all week if all this practice stuff, this Allen Iverson we're talking about practice stuff is getting overplayed a little bit, but you don't think so. No, yeah, I don't think so. You know, I just had a teammate go through the same um, fight scenario with uh, another fighter, so you get a guy in here, an old dog, that just still wants to show you, hey, I'm better than you, and I'm going to bring you to the cage and show you that I'm better than you, and I'm going to make a statement in this fight, and Ryan Bader's the guy to do it, and that's why I drove my butt from California all the way to Phoenix to see this wonderful co-main event tonight. I'm glad you came here, but I, my, my question is this. Look, you became the Bantamweight champion. You lost that in your last fight to Sergio Pettis, but there's talk of this Bantamweight Grand Prix. How important is for you to be part of that if it actually occurs? Oh, absolutely, Big John. You you know you lose you lose your title and you're like, man, I got to sit down. I got to reevaluate my career right now. You know, I just lost my title, and then uh, it's a blessing in disguise because now Scott Coker throws again in my lap, Big John, in my lap, another Grand Prix tournament with bad fighters, really high-level fighters right now in the bantamweight division across the world. You know, across the world, you got guys that had already made their name. 
You got guys like me and other guys that are coming up in Bellator that want to make that name against these guys. So we're coming in here, and if this Grand Prix kicks off, like I think it's going to, I'm excited. It really rejuvenated me. You know, I'm ready to go. I already lost a Grand Prix. I knew what it's like to lose a Grand Prix. I knew what it's like to lose a world title and gain a world title. So yeah, I'm just re rejuvenated, man. I'm telling you, I'm excited. What's different about fighting in a Grand Prix versus the regular the way a fighter prepares for a fight? You got, well, for one thing that excites you the most is the million dollars, right? Yeah, and you got imagine. not one belt, but you get two belts with everyone's name on there that you defeated. And uh, when you see that and you see it pass you the first time, you're like, oh, man, it just, it, I, look, I'm shaking thinking about it, you know? So, uh, but the, the difference between fighting Grand Prix, you have to fight smart, right? You got to be able to now navigate, take the right fights, move to the next round. It's about going on rounds and moving to the next round and uh, staying uh, injury prone right and making sure you can make it to that next round we've got an incredible co-main and main event tonight who are you picking Corey Anderson Ryan Bader and then Julius Anglixis against Vadam Nika he's Man. gonna steal whatever you come up with he's gonna steal it his own idea. I'm going with the champ Nemkov by far is leaps and bounds ahead of everyone right now in this division I feel like and again I think the old dog is gonna show the young dog again that he still has it so Bader and the champ Nemkov for a final rematch well world champions in Bellator if you didn't notice this <laughs> it's all it's all about the bling here oh, yeah. I don't, I mean, little, little did we realize. I don't know, Josh. I don't know what you got. Do you I know you got like trophy that, cases and stuff like that, but check that out. Let me see. Scott, Scott like Coker wasn't giving out rings back then. Okay, we're talking. I'm the history, baby. It's way, way back in the day. We were getting straps. I like it, though. I have to say, hearing I want Archuleta talk about this potential Bantamweight tournament and how excited he is, it gets me excited because I think, it, I mean, we've got such a stacked Bantamweight division. It would be truly a fantastic tournament. Yeah, I'm upset that I didn't, I didn't get to ask him a question. I want to know who he wanted in the first round. That's what I wanted to know. That's a good question. Well, I imagine we'll be able to ask him that at some point here soon. All right, well, in our feature prelim that we've got coming up here, we've got Carl Albrechtson, Albrechtson, excuse me, he's taking on Joe Vlashon, Yagshim Urgadov. Now, these guys, are they've got the contrasting styles. Josh, why should fight fans be excited for this one? So, Yags is someone who lost to Corey Anderson in the first round of the, of the tournament. But then also, when you get into this, Yags has got big power in his hands. He's got good wrestling takedown defense, as we saw against Corey Anderson. He's no slouch off of his back. He poses threats for Carl Albrechtson. But the thing with Carl is that he is... People underestimate how big he is. When I saw them face to face, I was like, wow, Cor Carl is thick. He's, he's tall. He's, he's got all the tools also once this fight hits the ground to make sure that he imposes his will on top of him. Now, I know you can't tell besides because of the, the, the wing on the right there. But, it's, but yeah, and also, Carl's got the, he's, he's got the natural wig that he's got going on there. But no, both of them are extremely talented. Both of them, it's not really a contrast of styles because Yags is a good wrestler. He's got big power in his hands. But I think Carl is very just, he's got the tenacity to get after him and do what he does. He wants to impose his will. But I also want to remind people, he has a win over our champion, Nemkov. And his brother. And his brother. That's right. So those are things that you have to take into consideration. He's dealt with some of the best guys in the world, and he's come out on top. All right. Uh, great analysis there. I do love the hair. Uh, we're going to check in with uh, Gareth A. Davies uh, one final time for his uh, analysis on this matchup. Carl Albrechtson fights Dovlechan Yakshimurdov in a battle of two aggressive light heavyweights tonight. Fighting out of Ukraine via Turkmenistan, Yakshimurdov, known as the Wolfhound, is actually a graduate in law and economics, but crunching numbers and words did little for him on his Bellator debut when he lost in the light heavyweight Grand Prix to Corey Anderson. As he says, my last fight was tough. Anderson was the better fighter that night. My fight with him was a lesson learned. I adjust and move forward. King Carl, meanwhile, holds notable victories over Bellator light heavyweight champion Vadim Nemkov and his brother Viktor Nemkov and comes in with momentum, having won six of his last seven fights. The Swede believes his stamina and ground game are to his advantage in this contest and he's even predicting that he will win by dominant ground and pound victory or even by submission, but he acknowledges that Yakshimurdov is a very dangerous fighter. Both men are promising a back and forth war, and I'm expecting nothing less. And you shouldn't, Gareth, because Carl Albertson may be the wild card 
in this entire 205 picture right now. And as we head towards our main event of the prelims, this one could live up to the expectations. And now, set to make his way to the cage, Dudley Chun Yakshimunidong. Born in Turkmenistan, from the Ukraine. So, of course, he had a fight in Germany. That John McCarthy referee. <laughs> of course. It had to be across the world. Look, he is a very, very fast fighter. He moves a lot inside of the cage. He's got good footwork. He's got a big overhand right. He's got a sneaky kick that will come up and touch the side of your head fast. You have to be very careful of the speed of Yakshin Muradov. So you're saying moving left versus him is not a great idea? Not a great idea at all. to Corey Anderson in the first round of the Grand Prix ended a five and a half year eight fight win streak which is exactly what Vadim Nemkov brings into the main event tonight. You're talking about the great fighters around the world just going to have to become used to the fact that this is a global sport right now and if there are names that are difficult to pronounce as fans get over it. Get come over, up, come up with a nickname. And learn them. Yes. Because enjoy what these guys can exactly do. Exactly right. And now, making his way, King Carhol Elbrickson. No shortage of confidence from this young man, the Swede, Carl Albrechtson. You heard Gareth A. Davies say the real wild card here because he is the last one to beat Vadim Nemkov. We talked about, you and I talked about the fight against Yuri Prochaska, <laughs> which Vadim Nemkov just ran out of gas, beating on Prochaska for 10 minutes. His next fight was in Ryzen a few months later, and that's where he lost to Carl Albertson. He hasn't lost since, but if he can keep his momentum going, Carl Albertson, boy, you've got that natural rivalry there as he's not only beating Vadim Nemkov, he's beating his brother too. That was his last fight. He got a big victory against Victor Nemkov. Nemkov, Vadim's older brother, and he put on a great performance. If there's one thing about Carl Albrechtson, he is not flashy at all. But man, he is solid, he is strong, and if he gets into the top position, he is just heavy there, and he does big damage at the point that he ends fights. This is against Victor Nemkov. Look at those elbows. He just continues to put pressure on his opponent and land big shots. He's got a great double leg takedown and he's able to get you off of the fence when he gets the underhooks and turn you and get you to the ground. Carl Albrechtson is a load for anybody. Let's check out the tail of the tape in this very loaded 205 division. 75.5 inch reach compared to 72. That is some distance. Now the speed of Yang Shimuradov could cause Albrechtson problems, but the strength is definitely going to be in King Carl's corner. Tonight here at Footprint Center, Phoenix, Arizona, the time has come to conclude our prelims here at Bellator 268. We'll do it with three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 205.4 pounds. His professional record 18 wins, six losses, one draw. Hailing from Turkmenistan, presenting Dublin Sean Yakshimunikov. And across the cage to that mystery out of the red corner at 6 foot 2, weighing in 204.1 pounds as the professional. 12 victories, three defeats from Stockholm, Sweden, King Carho Elmerickson. And with about rings, the referee in charge, Jason Herzog. Buddy ready. Buddy ready. Fuck! 
We often talk about record and resume. The three losses for Albertson. Phil Davis, Valentin Moldovsky, that was by decision. And Yuri Puchowski in Ryzen, and that was a fight he had won yeah. on a couple of occasions. That was a fun fight to watch, too. You know, his debut fight against Phil Davis here, he came in after, you know, training. He says, I don't even think Phil Davis remembers training with me. But it was in Sweden, he trained with him, and felt that he was going to be able to out-wrestle Phil Davis. That was a mistake because it got him tired in the fight, and Phil Davis was able to take over. But he is continuing to grow as a fighter. The best part about him is he stays within his lane. He knows where he's good, he knows where he's strong, just like you're seeing right here. He is a very tough fighter to get out of what he does well. See, do often see three, four inch height difference. Archie Mordoff, very solid 205, but only 5'11. Well, just this clinch work right here, this takes all that speed and throws it to the side. He's got to be in that center of the cage, free of motion, to utilize the speed difference. Carl Albertson's taken that away. All those things we talked about in the stand-up, about being very careful about moving left up, none of it matters if, if King Carl can keep him right here. Uh, when you're in this clinch game right here, but and this doesn't look like a whole lot for you know, the average fan, but there's so much going on right here, and this is very, very tiring. It is so grueling to be in a good clinch match with someone that knows what they're doing, puts pressure on you, little weight shifts, changes, nice elbow by Yang Shimmered off on the exit. It's very important for these guys that they're age and stage. 28 as Albertson is 32 for Yang Shimmered If you want to stay on the list at light heavyweight, we talked about the elite at the top as we head closer to the top of the hour in the semifinals of the light heavyweight Grand Prix. But how many elite level prospects are we talking about now who are at that 5-0, 5-1, 7-1, 8-1 stage at 205? So the, the time is now for these two guys. Oh, absolutely. And you got the other guys coming up like we saw earlier in Sullivan Cull. Yep. This, this division is just becoming more and more stacked. Again, the crowd spoiled by all the finishes we've had so far tonight. Eyes change the levels. You saw Albertson having the arms up high, shot the hands down, but wasn't able to get his hands clasped together. That's the big difference. Tried to switch it to a single there. You see Yang Shemuridov trying to control that arm, not allowing him to get his hands together. Now he's on the single. Well, this is one way, one way to do it, to get him off his feet. Well, you can see how much effort, how much energy is being expended in trying to get him off his feet, and nothing he's done to this point has gotten him close. A lot of those are big shots, but again, control. Yeah, and you're seeing, you know, those, the, those knee strikes that you're seeing, those are all in that clinch position. But that's the little things that just start to wear your opponent down, it starts to slow it down just a little bit. When your legs get kind of a little bit heavy and slow from the Charlie horses, it makes it to where now you're not that same guy, and now I can take advantage of it. Good leg kick, took Alfredson off balance. <laughs> Do enough. 
Kolarov. Grym dla Kalek, grym. Andas. Albertson looked in control when he had him in the clinch, when he had him along the fence. Boy, Yakshimorov is so dangerous in the center of the cage. You saw that Carl had to work very hard getting him up against the cage and then trying to get him down. He wasn't able to do that. And it's just the explosiveness and the speed of Yakshimorov. At any moment, he can explode and he builds in the fights. Every time that I've watched him fight, he starts slow and he continues to build as the rounds go on. So we'll see what happens in a second. Buddy ready. See that damage that came very late in the round. So if you remember that that nice elbow he landed on that exit, that had a little bit to do with that mark you're seeing on Albertson. right here this is a great position for him to be in the half guard he needs to just start taking his time framing out putting a hand towards the forehead towards the face towards the ear and dropping elbows when he can and then come up and land some big heavy punches he's finished fights with that left elbow Morinov trying to tie it up to prevent that exactly that nice job to stop. You see that underhook that Yang Shimurdov has, that's what's going to help him get to a standing position. You see him bracing up onto his elbow. He's doing all the things right to try to get there, and Albertson is doing the right things in stopping what he's doing. Beautiful job now getting himself more towards a head and arm choke. about the energy Albertson expended in the immediate aftermath of really hurting Yaksha Bordoff. Thought he might have had it finished. Then you go through that 20 or 30 seconds and the fight's still going on. And you got to worry about your gas tank with a lot of time left in the run. Yeah, but he's been able to control this position. Yeah. And this is him settling in, settling down, and just fighting the fight that he is meant to be in. Strikes from the your back. Big difference in that four of seven. You see how many strikes, almost 30 strikes landed, but here comes the submission attempt. That was a nice heel hook attempt. And at least it got Yang Shimurdov back to his feet. Oh! Knee. He got a sudden bit. He pulls him into a guillotine. Out of the jump knee. But he doesn't have it. He doesn't. He doesn't have the body position. 
position for him. He is not tight enough right now. Albertson is just laying there. You see there's no pop out of Joe. Third and long, Yakshamorov almost completed a long one there. Boy, he did. He pulled that one out and said, I'm going for it. That was a beautiful attempt with that jump knee. Set it up. He was, you know, rolling for the leg and rolling for the end. All of a sudden, Albertson was in a defensive posture. Albertson almost to the bow. He got it. Before. Again, nice job by Yag Shemurdoff. Again, rolling for it. Can come up with the top position here at least. Big shot. And the suplex late in round two. Not going to be enough to turn this round in his favor. But give Albertson some things to think about heading into round three. Going on in the corners, both guys cut. This is the shot. That went right off the top of the temple. That's what hurt you. Hurt Yakshimurd off. You saw Carl Albertson going after him, trying to finish. But here comes that flying knee. Ooh. It landed, man. It I'll did. Tell you what, Carl Albertson's got a shit because that landed fairly clean. That is a heavy weapon that landed on him. Big attack by Yag Shemurdov. Then he goes for the leg lock, and the leg lock in the end at least gets him into the top position. You got to think, Yag Shemurdov thought he had a real shot at that game team because he must have felt that knee land. He had to be thinking, I, I got a shot here. That was impressive for Albertson to stay out of trouble the way he did. Great job by the Bellator cut, man. Take a look at both guys. No blood. Both of them have been stopped. That's what Cutman will do. They will give you another round. I wonder, you got to think. Albertson is ahead. Yaksha Mordov so dangerous, especially here in this stand-up. Albertson doing a very good job with the pressure, though. Making Yaksha Mordov fight with his back towards the cage. Yanksha Murdoff should go back to that low calf kick that he's landed effectively throughout the fight. See, right there, you could see in that level change, the energy was different. He just doesn't have that speed and that explosiveness. Nice shot by Yanksha Murdoff. in this position, we haven't seen Yachimorda for what he wants to do with it along the fence. Nice job of bringing that kick up high. Nice job. Man. That was clean. That was a clean shot. It's really the pressure of Carl Albert. Yeah, he keeps coming forward. The pressure is starting to get to Yag Shemurdov. He's getting tired based upon moving backwards and having someone continue to put that pressure where he doesn't have that chance to grab air. A slower level changes now for Albertson. Put him in danger of the guillotine here a couple of times. But... Outstanding. Yeah, that's really good stuff. Yag Shemurdov in a really tough spot here. Losing the fight now with halfway through round three. He's in a bad spot. <laughs> Defending here for Yachimoto is not going to be enough. Oh, he's going to have to get himself out of this position, just like he did in the past, where he exploded at least to get him out of the mouth, get him back to a half guard, start building that process of getting yourself.
Hands on back of your feet. Nice job again. He entwines the leg here. You see Carl Albertson stopping his ability to use that leg to control his. And that's what starts to break you down. Now Yasha Murdoch had that big explosion. Nothing came of it. It did not work for him. He's back in the same position with less gas. He's in a worse position now. You want to be a top 10 light heavyweight in Bellator, you got to run. He finds his energy just incredibly explosive. That was a beautiful job of just exploding out of the mouth. Obviously trying to separate the hands. Oh, yeah, a couple of those got thrown. He's taking some real shots in this fight. Yes, he has. See the numbers. The difference in those strikes now. It's a lot more shots, but a lot of those have come on the ground. Joe oh. with the power shots. The spinning heel kick, and now he clipped him with the right. Albertson is some serious trouble here going into the final minute. Thanks for burning off landing some huge shots right there. You saw the eye. They were and he's, he's trying to gain and get himself stable right now. He took some big shots. These two guys have done serious damage to each other in this fight. As deep and strong as this division is, both fighters have landed shots that would have won them fights against other guys. You are so right. There was some big shots landed. Just think of the knee going back and those shots. Carl Albertson has shown that, man, you know, he is not a guy that you can just put down. What a chin. Both of them. This is really high-level stuff, as we hoped and expected it would be. And fitting, we go down to the final seconds with one last exchange. Great stuff. Great stuff for 205. against the fence he had nowhere to go those shots landed yeah that was he pulled that yeah he knew he was close still landed with that chip look at those shots yep and carl albertson just eats them man doesn't go down gets a hold of his opponent brings it close for the clinch you hit that man with a baseball bat he's just gonna snort at you that's big time stuff I think you and I both tended to see it the same way with Albertson getting those first two rounds, but you just never know. No, you don't. You could have been. One guy who knows is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. All three, Michael Bell, Ron McCarthy, Sean Dallas Hall, have it exactly the same 29 to 28, all have it for the winner by unanimous decision, King Carho Albrechtson. Fans are unhappy because Yaksha Mordov had the big third round and he landed the more stylish shots. Absolutely. But out of the
the 15 minutes. That was Carl Albertson's fight. The judges got it right. I agree. That was a good call. And this is when it's tough with the three rounds because of the way Yagshamurdov finished this fight. A lot of people think, oh, no, he deserved it. No, and Carl put on a great performance, showed a lot of heart, showed a hell of a chin. That was a fun fight. Guys, a night in which all eyes are going to be on 205 in Bellator. That is a great way to kick it off. Well, it certainly is, Josh. I mean, can we talk about the chin of Carl? I mean, both of these fighters. What a fantastic performance. You know, I don't like to give John a whole lot of credit about the scoring, but I feel like he knows a little something about it. He did a great job in scoring that fight. Overall, though, uh, it was an amazing fight. And I got to tell you, I was talking back and forth with some fans here as well, and they're like, oh, my God, what's going on? It was it was a great action-packed fight. This is one of those fights where it, wa it, it leaves you wanting more. I want to see this a second fight. I want to see it be a main event now. Bellator's doing five-round main events now, and I would like to see that fight potentially be a main event now to see a five round. I want to see the other two rounds. I want, to see, I want to see both of them again real soon inside the cage. Uh, I think that's a great point, though, a perfect example of a fight that we would love to see for five rounds. Well, like I said, he has a win over Nemkov, so that inserts him kind of waiting in the, in the background of whoever wins this tournament potentially in there. Uh, let's talk really quick. Um, we're going to relook at uh, what we've got coming up on Showtime, but if you look at the four fights that we've got coming up, if you want to make a prediction now for maybe fight of the night, what are you thinking? I actually had that going to be the fight of the night. Okay, I, I oh, there was, all right. I thought that was going to be fight of the night, and it started off a little slow in terms of the, the first round. And then they got the ball rolling, and they realized both of them could take each other's shots. And there was some wrestling involved. It was a full mixed, a full mixed martial arts fight. The spinning wheel kick. You saw the, you saw Carl throw the right hand, and then come back with a backhand, and then throw the straight left. Those are things you don't see very often, but they were utilizing every single tool, and it was so nice to see. I'm glad, especially at 205, they tend to slow down as the fight goes on. There was no slowing down. Absolutely that was not. an absolute amazing fight. Fantastic. Looking forward to seeing both of them very soon. Uh, and the fans, hey, here in, in Phoenix, great show for them tonight. All right, well, here's one final look at the incredible lineup of fights we've got coming up on Showtime at the top of the hour. The night kicks off with a brawler versus wrestler. We've got Henry Corrales. He's taking on Vladislav Perevchenko at 145. And then we've got Benson Henderson. He's on a quest to add another world championship to his resume and hopes a win over the former champ Brent Primus will solidify a title shot next and Ryan Bader well he wants that light heavyweight belt back and in order to get it well he's got to get a win over a dangerous opponent and Corey overtime Anderson tonight and in our main event the current champ Vadim Nemkov is a heavy favorite when he takes on a new opponent in the tournament alternate Julius Alixkus but as we have seen in the past you cannot count out the underdog four fantastic fights trust me you're not going to want to miss them we will see you over on showtime in just a bit thanks for watching the light heavyweight throne is closer than ever reigning champ Vadim Nemkov looks unstoppable but striker Julius Angliskas will stop at nothing for his title shot plus Ryan Darth Bader is on a mission to reclaim the belt against the devastating ground game of Corey Anderson. The light heavyweight World Grand Prix semifinals, live tonight at 10 on Showtime, where warriors rule. On Saturday, October 16th, the Bellator Light Heavyweight Grand Prix picks up with semifinals action. In one of the world's toughest tournaments, in one of the deepest divisions in all of MMA. The best 205 pound 
light heavyweight division in MMA right now. Four fighters will enter, but only two will advance. There's so many ramifications in this tournament. The co-main event pops off with a bang, featuring number two ranked light heavyweight Corey Overtime Anderson, whose outwork you mentality and now famous ground and pound, ground and pound has him one step closer to achieving his ultimate dream, a world title. I'll fight in the dumpster in the alley, it doesn't matter. It's the elbow attack from Corey Anderson. No crowd, a full crowd. I'm here to fight and win. Fulfilling this dream will not be easy as he'll be facing a familiar foe in Bellator's first ever two division champion, Ryan Darth Vader. The former light heavyweight champion is on the hunt for gold once again. After losing his title to current champion Vadim Nemkov, Vader is focused on Anderson and the chance to get back what was once his and a possible rematch with Nemkov himself. It's a perfect opportunity for me for redemption. The main event is a Cinderella story in the making with the news of Anthony Rumble Johnson's withdrawal from the tournament. It will be Julius Anglicus uh, who's on a hot run. Grand Prix alternate Julius Anglicus finds himself staring at the opportunity of a lifetime. Stand-up style of Anglicus. From the number five ranked light heavyweight to a Bellator title contender overnight. And Glickskis has his sights set on achieving one of the greatest upsets in Bellator history. Standing in his way is light heavyweight kingpin Vadim Nemkov. Nemkov is a special talent in my view. 25 year old's pretty impressive. No longer overlooked, Nemkov is in the midst of a historical run, dispatching five former champions in a row while amassing one of the most impressive win streaks in all of MMA. October 16th, live on Showtime, Nemkov will be looking to continue his division dominance when he steps in to defend his light heavyweight title, his honor, and his legacy. Four fighters, only two tickets to the final, and a chance at the million-dollar cash prize. This is Countdown, the light heavyweight Grand Prix semifinals. Uh, a little bit more of athletic type training day so for me my job today is to get everything moving get his body firing on all cylinders firing on all cylinders has not been an issue for the reigning heavyweight world champion Ryan Bader final round take down number two for Bader storming onto the Bellator scene in 2017 Bader captured the light heavyweight championship belt in his very first fight with the promotion. Ryan Bader is the new Bellator champion. You know, I always try to be different every time I go out. When I'm out there, they can read me and watch film. And, you know, I want to be different every single time. Just 10 months after winning the title, the MMA veteran would step up a weight class competing in his first Grand Prix. Uh, I did the heavyweight Grand Prix. The bracket started to fill out, uh, filled with, you know, legends, Fedor, we had Frank Mir, you know, Matt Mitrione, King Mo, and all those guys. Bellator light heavyweight champion Ryan Bader competing for the first time. Oh! He's already dropped the ball with the left hand. Ryan Dark Bader in lightning quick fashion. Mamma mia! Ultimately made to the finals with Fedor. Heavyweight belt is on the line. Here we go! Actually ended up working out textbook perfectly, knocking him out with a left. And that was just a great night. You know, everything came together. I beat a legend. Two division champion and doing that by you know winning the heavyweight grand prix That's ryan bader's two division reign was short-lived oh, he's feeling he's something out of them oh, losing his light heavyweight title to none other than vadim nemkov 
But for the veteran, his latest challenge has him excited to prove himself once again. Here, 38 years old, my confidence is an all-time high. I feel like I've hit those pinnacles of, you know, winning championships. I want to go out there and win a second Grand Prix in two different weight classes. Down. Hill, hill. Hill. Being the former two-division champ means you have a target on your back each time out. And Bellator newcomer Corey Anderson had his sights set on Vader from the moment he joined the promotion. I knew coming over to Bellator, I was one of the top guys going to be there. And at the time, Vader was the champ. So I knew eventually it was going to happen. The thing I'm most excited about about the Vader fight, he was the 205 champ and currently the heavyweight champ. So if I go out there and beat him and I'll beat him pretty good, I mean, I'll go ahead and get his 205 belt. Now I might turn around and just say, all right, I want the heavyweight belt next to With a 15 and five record in his eight year professional career, Corey Anderson knows the hard work it takes to get to the top of the game. In fact, that mentality was ingrained in him from the start. Everybody know me as the country boy, you know, they call me big country right here because I came from a small town, small country area where everything we did was work. You know, grew up on a farm, had horses, cows, chickens. My dad had a roofing company. I wrestled, played football, baseball, basketball, everything growing up. So on top of school and sports, we had to come home and we had to handle chores and then we had to handle the family business. There you go, and then you move to your right. So with that, just as we grew up, hard work was just something we did daily. It wasn't a task, it wasn't a chore. Sure, it's kind of like we are expected when we wake up, all right, it's time to get to work. So when I work out, when I do everything I do, I do everything.